Art Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of Fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark, presented by Weird Darkness. Each week I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Spreading the word about the show helps it to grow. If you're here because you're already a fan of nostalgic audio and print, you'll want to email WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows for free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Coming up, it is the entire six-episode serial of Orbit 1-0. Orbit 1-0 was a British science fiction radio drama in six 30-minute parts. The plot involves the search for a source of gamma radiation in space and the discovery of a mysterious cylinder on a remote island. The cylinder quickly takes center stage, but a connection to the radiation source becomes important to the final resolution of the story. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness as we listen to Orbit 1-0 from 1961. From London, we present Orbit 1-0, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode 1 the Unseeing Eye. In Fleet Street, they say a good story gets its facts across. So facts, it's going to be. My name's Tom Lambert, and I work in a daily paper that maybe came through your letterbox this morning. It's a good many years now since I wrote my last article on the cosmic noise and what followed. But it's my belief that the whole inside story never was told. That was why a few weeks ago I tracked down the man who lives with the whole truth, Dr. Hayward Petrie. I found him in an Oxfordshire village. He's retired now. And we talked about the old days for a long time. I came away with an empty notebook, but not empty-handed. I have here six reels of recording tape which Dr. Petrie lent me. His own recordings made ten years ago... Dictated by him, alone in his study, remembering. I've played these tapes. It's all here, better than I could tell it. Our glimpse across a weird threshold on the rim of space where there should be nothing but eternal frozen darkness. Yet where there was something more. You're going to hear the first of the Petrie recordings. For the moment, I need do no more than press the switch and let Dr. Petrie and the fact speak for themselves. Ready? Notes, first reel. My name is John Hayward Petrie. I'm a doctor of science, and my purpose in making these observations is to... Uh, oh, hang it, I, I, I can't lecture to a machine. I'll do this my own way or not at all. Now, where to begin? I must go back. Kensington, London. Some years ago, the old Imperial Museum in South Kensington was turned into the Commonwealth College of Science. It worked well, the college. Some of the old vision of empire must have lingered, though, because there was a department to study a new potential empire, space. The School of Astrophysics. East Wing, third floor, quite handy for the canteen. I was its head in those days, and a keen crowd we were. It really began on a grey November day in the college's second year. I was lecturing my course that morning. Among the heads bent dutifully over notebooks, 
were two that with me were to experience things that would make us doubt our sanity. But none of us knew that then. To summarize, the effects of cosmic radiation filtered by the Earth's atmosphere and observed in relation to botany and geology are understood well enough. But the source of these radiations remains one of the best guarded secrets of the universe. Well, uh, <clears throat> that'll be all for today, ladies and gentlemen. We shall not now meet again until next January, by which time I trust I shall have received an admirably learned thesis from each one of you. Good morning. What, my dear Miss Ryder, is that? A new form of lecture shorthand? Hello, Cliff. This? Yeah. Oh, just a doodle. Some doodle. I've been watching it develop for the last half hour. It took me right out of myself and the lecture. Well, if anything, it represents the state of mind of a second-year student with two months to produce a thesis and who hasn't a clue for a subject. Sure, Liz. Me too. Well, that wraps it up for this term. Do we drown our sorrows in canteen tea? I think we do. Let's go before the queue reaches halfway to Marble Arch. Don't forget your notes, Cliff. You're going to leave them. Don't remind me. Table? Am I the trade, Bill? Want some hot tea down your neck? Or... Well, I guess we can squeeze in here by the window. Okay. Have a chocolate biscuit? Thanks. You know, Cliff, it's hard to believe sometimes. That this is tea? Believe me, in no other civilized land do they make tea quite no, like this. No, out there, pending them, with the mist. It hasn't changed in a hundred years. And here we sit in the middle of six pools of electronics. And this is a science college, not a school for romantic lady poets. Now back to Earth, Liz. Petrie won't accept a sonnet for a thesis. Ten thousand words. That's a lot of words. And a lot of hours in my bed sitter in Chelsea. And a lot of shillings for the gas meter. You're not trying to get home for Christmas? Clear. Daddy works for a copper mine. He doesn't own one. He paid my fair hair from Rhodesia. And if I don't pass at the end of next year, well, I can see myself walking back. Look, if one of us is doomed to fail, Liz, it certainly won't be you. And Montreal is no bus ride away. My people run a hardware store. So I guess I sweat it out in the college hostel. We'll send each other Christmas cards. And you can take me to see the Christmas tree in Trafalgar Square. You've got yourself a date. Well, well. Now, why is our colleague from down under fighting his way over here? You'll make it, Whitey. Hi, Liz. Got a message for you two. The prof wants to see you when it's done. Dr. Petrie? Yeah, be waiting. Don't rub in the wrong way for Pete's sake. Many a good scholarship now hangs in the balance. Dr. Petrie is a pet. Maybe to you he is. There's a difference. We better go, Liz. Thanks, Whitey. Okay. What have we done to deserve this? Nothing, I hope. Come on. If we can carve our way through. We had to have a corner table. Excuse us, please. Don't block the gangway. Thanks, thanks. Come in. Ah, Mr. Boyd and Miss Ryder. You got my message? Yes, sir. Yes, Good. Sir. Sit down, please. Thank you, sir. Ah. Uh, I have your course records here. I've been glancing through them. They, uh, yes, they may not on the whole suggest that you're the two most brilliantly gifted students of your year. We don't think so either, Doctor. We just hope we're good enough to get through all three. Yes. Still, you do have something that's rare even here. Inquiring minds. Now, look here. If neither of you are committed for Christmas, how would you like to spend it 80 miles out in the Atlantic? The Atlantic? Well, not afloat on an island. Well, sir, I guess... But we have theses to get started work on. Well, uh, perhaps the two can be combined. I have a letter here from an old colleague of mine. Yes, uh, Professor Campbell McLaren. He's in charge of the radio telescope that three of our universities built between them. The one in the Outer Hebrides? Yes. It's on the Isle of Skara, about 40 miles west of Barra. It's a very powerful apparatus, more adaptable than the one at your little bank. McLaren's been working there in splendid isolation for two years, studying cosmic radiation. Has he made any progress? Well... McLaren is the least excitable person alive, and that's why the voluble style of his letter puzzles me. However, the point is, he wants a second opinion on some findings. He suggests that I spend a few weeks there and bring a couple of students to assist. You can make observations, take notes, and I will accept in exchange 7,000 words on radio astronomy, but Great. not one less. Well? I'd love to come, sir. 
I, I'm not asking what you would love, Miss Ryder. I wish to know if you feel you would benefit from an insight into field research. I mean, yes, I think it would be very helpful. Huh, good. And what about you, Mr. Byrne? Glad if you'll count me in, too, sir. I was reading about the Scar Telescope in the scientific journal. It has a range of five billion light years and can detect the fastest receding galaxies. I'm not unaware of those facts, Mr. Bowen. I wrote that article. Sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I shall be leaving in three days' time. Uh, McLaren mentions November gales and advises thick clothing. I'm purchasing a garment called um, a, a duffel coat, in which I shall look quite ridiculous. <laughs> he does also mention some other work outside the laid-down program. In his own well-chosen words... Some wee back room messing about, which should be right up your street. <laughs> well, we shall see. Uh, please meet me at Houston at 8 p.m. on Monday evening. Right. I'll make a traveling arrangement. Thank you, sir. Fine. Now, I really have a great deal of work to do, so um, uh, good morning, Bill. We'll be there. Goodbye, sir. Good morning, Dr. Petrie. Good morning. Well, how do you like that? Is that character a sheep in wolf's clothing or the other way around? Now and then he gets to be almost human. But not for long. He's just a bit shy, that's all. Shy? Oh, sure, and modest, too. Like your Dr. Johnson was. <laughs> now, come on, we've got a lot to do before Monday. Yes, let's go. The Isle of Skara. A lonely, tilted granite paving stone jutting out of the ocean. Even from the steamer, we could see the radio telescope straddling the highest end like some enormous black crab, two towering pylons, and between them, the reflector, a vast upturned bowl. We went ashore at Kirkuish, the only harbour, and the only village. The island's only taxi rattled us up steep lanes and across windswept moorlands, where sheep huddled behind crumbling flint walls. It left us at the very foot of the telescope, and then it, it scuttled away as if nervous of the brooding monster it had dared to disturb. The three of us gazed up in silence. The wind whined through the two tall lattice towers. Slung between them in a cradle of girders, the monstrous hollow eye gazed coldly at the leaden sky. Only this steel creature was blind. It saw by listening. It was almost a relief to see the homely white-haired figure of McLaren trotting down towards us in a flapping overcoat. Oh, dear. Grand to see you again, Hayward. I saw the steamer put in. That's a big event here. Ah, hello, Campbell. If we were just paying homage to your creation, rather like the popular idea of an invading Martian. Oh, don't be unkind to it. It may look a wee bit unfriendly today, but when the sun's out, it can look quite pretty. It looks as if it might decide to eat us at any moment. <laughs> oh, oh, my. Uh, Campbell, may I introduce Mr. Little Ryder, Mr. Clifford Bully. How do you do, Ryder, Mr. Bowden? So you're the ones he talked into this. That's yeah. right. Glad to have you. Now, let's get inside. It never stops blowing on Scara. I think we may as well go straight up to the signal box. The signal box? Aye, the control room. It's slung up there, just under the bowl. It's safer than it looks. There's a lift. A lift? Oh, we have every modern convenience. Now, uh, watch your step. These parts are slippery. Right. We will. A lift inside one of these supporting towers whirred upwards. We crossed a narrow catwalk where Elizabeth looked down once and didn't try it again. And then we were in a warm, spacious, glass-paneled laboratory. One felt still on the ground up there until you looked out and saw all the island, the Atlantic below you, or up where the bowl of the telescope blotted out the whole sky. This is where we were. And this is my assistant who shares my exile here. Peter Garrick. How do you do? Pleased to meet you, Dr. Petrie. I've read all your papers on solar physics. Oh, well, I'm glad someone has. And Miss Ryder and Mr. Bowen from the CCS in Kensington. How do you How do? You do? No, yeah. Well, now, you all know the form, of course. We can either send out impulses ourselves and they'll bounce back from bodies in their path. Or we can receive short waves from any source that emits them. A, uh, how's that analysis coming on, Peter? Is our first Centauri still complaining? Yes, quite a disturbance. It's coming through very steadily. We're tracking one of our celestial neighbors, the star Alpha Centauri, a mere five light years away. He seems to be having a little cosmic indigestion, throwing out masses of white-hot hydrogen. I uh, uh, like to hear him doing it. Mm, love to. Uh, let's have the audio range, Peter. Right. I'll bring him in. Aye, 
there he is. The sound of a furnace hot enough to shrivel the earth, but too far for any ordinary telescope to see. Of course, we're not hearing the physical activity, just the radiations it gives off. Yes, quite a... Uh, uh, swing off to a general bearing, Peter. Let's have the third program for a change. Anything in particular? No, the full orchestra. Right. Well, look at that. The bowl up there is turning, and we're going with it. The whole structure is mounted on a circular track. There are 20 electric motors driving this lot. When we're observing, the whole thing creeps automatically. I see. It has to, of course, to counteract the air's rotation. Yes, good. This bearing ought to give us a fair selection. Just a moment. There it is, Hayward. The creaking of the universe. The voices of a million galaxies. Some of those signals began their journey before men learned to live in caves and chipped flints and have only just arrived. But all that is dead noise given out by bodies much like our own sun. Aye, and there are more things in heaven and earth. Campbell, what do you mean? I'm not sure that I know myself. Oh. There, you see, it goes on tape and into these computers for analysis. And these pens scratch it out in graph form, mile after mile of it. Oh, you research people have all the fun. I like one of these in Kensington. <laughs> well, tomorrow we'll get down to it in detail. Surely. I'd be glad of your advice on one or two problems. Well, uh, shall we go down? Yes. We have our quarters in those concrete buildings near the cliff. We live well enough, thanks to Mrs. McWhorter, our resident cook. She's promised us dinner at seven. Peter, hmm? at eight, will you go on to bearing C-60? C-60? Tonight, sir? Yes, tonight. Very good. I'd hang on to the handrail when you get outside. The wind seems to be getting up. One of our problems is the rain that collects in the bowl. On a bad day, the rain stops at the cook with something like six tons of water. McLaren's living room, with its chintz curtains and cheerful fire, seemed that night the coziest place on earth. We might have been in the heart of London, save for the wind and the waves pounding on the rocks below. And all the time we were conscious of that vast steel monster towering into the darkness outside. And McLaren himself seemed uneasy and kept glancing at his watch. And at a quarter past eight, he said, Hey, would I've been doing a little work of my own, a sort of sideline. I think it might interest you. We could take a look now, if you'd care to. I, I said I would. So McLaren led me out of the concrete block, and we dashed through the rain to another which housed the electric generators, then down some bare steps into a series of basement rooms. The last and largest was not as elaborately equipped as the signal box, but there were control consoles, a computer in a shiny grey cubicle, and another recording machine its stylus scratching a jagged red line on a creeping roll of graph paper. And as soon as he closed the door, I realized that McLaren had only been keeping up his cheery manner with an effort. I dare say you're surprised to find another laboratory down here. The universities don't know about this yet. Well, I knew you were keen on investigating cosmic radiation, Campbell, but... Uh... No, this is something else. I... Now, uh... Where to begin? Look at that pen, Hayward. Mm -hmm. See the trace it's making? Yes, it, it seems fairly regular. Is, is it something the telescope is picking up? Aye. Then it's on to a certain bearing. What do you mean? I'll put it in a nutshell. A year ago, we noticed that a very persistent signal kept breaking in on our rubber recording. Oh. We put it down to meteor showers or the like. Then one day, for something to do, we focused accurately on them and recorded them for several hours. Garrick was curious about the results, so we fed them into the computers. Uh -huh. The usual variations emerged. But this time, they were in the form of a regular pattern. Oh, but, oh, no, but that's impossible. <clears throat> Cosmic emanations are either continuous or intermittent. There could be no system. Uh, unless... I... Unless what? Well, I... Unless they were from some artificial source in, in some way being, well, 
transmitted. We made more recordings and more. We analyzed, compared sequences, and soon we had no doubts at all. There was form and system. No. There could be only one thing, a means of communication. Soon we confirmed something else, the position of the source and the range. Well, if they're coming from some distant nebula... They're not, Heywood. Huh? They originate somewhere on the edge of our solar system. We place the point of origin at a distance of no more than 500,000 million miles. You mean just beyond the orbit of the farthest planet from the sun, Pluto? Just so. The edge of outer space. Good. Well, listen to this. Hear it for yourself. intelligence behind that sound. And I'll tell you something else. Garrick has worked for months on the breakdown graphs. An organized system is emerging. It's a code. And he believes he's on the way to breaking it. Good heavens, I... Of course, any kind of common word language is out of the question. It would have to be some other way of transmitting ideas. It could be figures, theorems, atomic numbers, the linear spectrum. Things constant to all matter everywhere. Mathematics, after all, is a universal language. Just so. Good heavens, I... You know, if we're right, Hayward, this is an event of tremendous importance. Uh, have you made uh, any statements? No. Communication with some other intelligence beyond the Earth. We have... we've got to be very sure. Campbell, this is fascinating. I must go over it with you in the smallest detail. Uh, once we can find the basic key, that's a voice we are hearing. A small voice speaking to us across space... We must learn to understand it. We must. Well, I gave a brief account of the evening's activities to our two young people and let them hear the signals. And then for the next three days that followed, we thought of little else. We spent them either in the underground laboratory or in the high control room beneath the telescope, poring over the neatly filed rolls of squared paper. And on and on went that jagged red line, saying so much, but then meaning so little to us. On the third day, McLaren and I wanted to work alone, so Clifford and Elizabeth took the brief opportunity to look over the island. They explored the harbour of Kirkuish, took snapshots, and ended up in the evening at the small stone inn near the jetty. Any good at thoughts, Smith? Heck no, that crazy little board, I can't even hit it. But I'll take you on at ice hockey any time. It's not played much in pubs, I'm afraid. Good evening, sir. Good evening, landlord. Usual for you, Liz? Yes, please. One tomato juice and a half of draft. One tomato juice and a half of draft. Well, Cliff, we have walked into something. We certainly have. But nobody sane believes that any other planet beyond Mars can possibly support any life beyond a few fungi and mosses. Too far from the sun. No light, no heat. And beyond Pluto, half a billion miles. There's nothing out there. Just freezing darkness. And nothing. Well, that's what the book says. But let's just hope for the sake of professional dignity that those signals don't turn out to be mixed up dance music from Radio Istanbul or somewhere. Somehow, I don't think they will, Cliff. Neither do I. There's something about that noise that gave me the creeps around the back of my neck. One tomato juice and a half of draft. That will be one and nine, please, sir. Right. One and nine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, cheers. Cheers. The young lady and yourself will be concerned with the contraption, no doubt. That's right. Hey, just listen to that wind out there. Landlord. Are there ever days here when you could keep a hat on? Oh, yes. But this is the third winter, so there will be bad weather. The third winter? What's that? It is the time when the Kirkuish monster visits us. The Kirkuish monster? It is a fisherman's story. It is said the sea monster returns to Skara every third year and swims round it, bringing ill weather and driving off the fish. Have you seen him? Or does he only appear when no one's looking? It is a story. They say the place to watch from is Dromaird Point on the north of the island. No, I cannot say that I have seen the monster. But then, I cannot say that I have. Well, I think it's time we were getting back here. Okay, Liz. Good night, landlord. 
Good night, sir. Good night. We'll look out for the monster. Aye. Seamus. I... I have been wondering. Are the dead fish being washed in again? Yes. I had hair that they were. continued. I saw McFarland's point. There was no hard proof. We might cause a sensation and then have to admit to chasing a theory. But the proof then was closer than any of us imagined. It was nearly a week later on a grey afternoon when Clifford and Elizabeth were following a cliff path on the north side of the island. The mad point. Goodness, it's bleak and lonely. Yeah. Just the rocks and the cold breakers falling in from the Atlantic. Up here, you could almost start believing those fishermen thought it. Now, Liz, do you really believe that's the scientific approach? Well, it's supposed to be our inquiring minds that got us here. I just happen to have a little imagination as well. Well, my imagination never works so good with my ears half frozen off. <laughs> oh, poor old Cliff. Cliff? Yeah. Look there. Where? Look at the sea. Just beyond the last of those rocks, where all the gulls are gathering. There's a big circle of foam. Hey, you're right, there is. Must be a couple of hundred yards across. The water's all churned up. Almost looks like it's boiling. Which today, I would say, is unlikely. Did you hear that? Yeah. And I felt it through the rock we're standing on. I'm sure it's coming from out there. That's quite some disturbance. Can't be volcanic, not here. Hey, and get a look at those waves coming in. Those gulls, Cliff. Which fish are they diving for? They're snatching them from the surface. They look as if they're dead ones. Oh, they sure do. Hey, Liz. You know, that spot isn't, isn't far below the tide line. And the tide's going out. Now, I reckon it'll be uncovered in another hour. Mm. We could walk out to it. Sure, let's do that. Let's stay around for a while and do it. I guess this was just about the place. But there's not a thing here now. Just firm, wet sand. And the gulls have gone. I've never seen such a lonely place. What could it have been, Cliff? Oh, maybe just an eddy, some freak local current. But there seemed to be force there. Something pretty powerful. Well, my feet are getting wet, so let's go. Hey, hold it. Can you hear that, Liz? kind of humming. Yes. It's underneath the sand. I'm sure it is. Look. It's vibrating the seawater in that pool. Claire, what is it? Well, I need more than three guesses. And for something that hums, this is some place for it to be. Hey. The sand is soft enough. It wouldn't take as long to scoop a hole. What with? Hands, girl, hands. The best tools in the world. Only four are better than two. All right. Cliff, you don't suppose we could be teasing an old mine, do you? Uh-uh. Mine's rust up. It could be we're sitting on top of something else. The lair of the Kakuish monster. Had you thought of that? Oh. 
Well, what is it? Oh, a great fat lugworm. Oh, it's hopeless. As fast as we make the hole bigger, it fills up with water. I'm getting soaked. We need spades. Well, it can't be down so deep. Try and keep going, Liz. Oh, there goes a nail. Pip, I broke it on something hard. Hey, I just let the sand settle. Yeah, do you see it? There's some kind of curved edge. Let me get down there. It goes down quite a way. It looks like a circular metal plate. It's covered with tiny shellfish. Yeah, marine crustacei. Sea deposit. Must have been submerged for years. Now we're getting to it, Liz. You feel that vibration? The thing's going like a dynamo. Cliff, don't touch it anymore. I don't like it. You can see what it is now, can't you? Yeah, I guess so. The end. It's about three feet across, and it runs quite a way under the sand. It's a cylinder. An enormous, great cylinder. That was Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes, written by Peter Elliot Hayes, and produced for the BBC by David Davis. From London, we present Orbit One Zero. A play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode two, The Cylinder. This is Tom Lambert. You've now heard the first of the tape recordings made by Dr. Hayward Petrie. In it, he described his visit to Skara in the Hebrides where Professor McLaren was in charge of the giant radio telescope, the strange pattern of signals that were being monitored, and the finding in a lonely cove of a vibrating cylindrical object. Already the thing we would come to fear was taking shape. In this, the second recording, Dr. Petrie continues his notes from that point. Notes, reel two. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, that blustering day on Skara. McLaren and I were at work in the underground monitoring room when Clifford and Elizabeth returned from Dromed Point. Returned with a curious account of a cylinder buried under a beach. They seemed so impressed that we took McLaren's ancient car and drove round the coast to see for ourselves. Before we left, Clifford insisted on collecting four spades. There was the cold, deserted bay and the beach. We were led down a cliff path and shown a spot where they had scratched out the sand. We each took a spade and dug, and in less than an hour, we had uncovered a most remarkable object. Well, what on earth would you make of that, he would? Uh, it's a cylindrical shape, all right. Three feet in diameter and about eight feet long. But what it is under all that encrustation... Could it be some kind of natural formation? And it's very regular. It almost looks like part of a pillar. But this is hardly an archaeological site. Clifford, you say you heard a humming sound. Well, yes. I guess it must have stopped while we were away. But Liz heard it, too. And there was that disturbance while the sea was still covering it. Yeah. Very curious. Well... What now? The tide will cover this spot again before long. Well, we've enough on our hands, but I suppose this is worth spending a little time on. Though what we can do here... Hey, can I make a suggestion? Go ahead. I noticed a crane truck back at the telescope. Yes, the transporter for heavy equipment. Well, the road meets the beach farther along. So it does. The crane and maybe some chain tackle. Well, look, I've driven bulldozers back home. I guess I can handle that. Well, it's the only way we'll ever get this thing out. All right with you, Campbell? Yes, of course. 
Very well. Is your operation delivered? <clears throat> Oblige me by not breaking your neck over it. <laughs> no, sir. Or that crane, because that's something the college will have to pay for. I'll be careful, sir. I gave no more thought to the object until the following afternoon. Then, looking down from the telescope control room, I saw the transporter pull up by the generator block. Clifford emerged from the cab and supervised the efforts of three resigned islanders he'd pressed into service to haul the cylinder into the building. It seemed his salvage scheme had been successful and that the object was lighter than I had imagined. That same evening, we found Clifford, Elizabeth and Peter Garrick in one of the basement rooms surveying their trophy with some pride. They had mounted it on trestles and Garrick was armed with a hammer and a cold chisel. Lying there under the hard, white strip lights, the corroded cylinder might well have been the corpse of some hoary sea beast. This really is interesting. I've been taking measurements. The ends are perfect circles, 34 inches in diameter, and slightly domed. It's 90 inches long. If I can chip away some of these deposits, we can see what it's made of. Well, if it turns out to be solid gold, let us know. We'll be up in the signal box. Right, sir. I'd be glad if you'd come and take some notes, Clifford. Yes, sir. And you, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. I'll be up shortly. I'll just make a start on this. <coughs> Leaving young Garrick chipping away, we went up in the lift to the glass-walled control room beneath the vast bowl of the telescope. And again we watched the dancing green traces on the oscilloscopes and listened to those thin, insistent signals reaching us across 5,000 million miles of space. Hello. That sequence sounds familiar. Where's Garrick's chart? He's taken photographs of all the recurring waveforms. Yes, this looks like it. It's very similar. We got this on August 9th last, and before that on May the 3rd. You see, Hayward, it is systematic. There's method, intelligence behind this. Intelligence? But that means life in some form. Life on the outermost edge of the solar system, where no life can conceivably exist. Because of the conditions. Unimaginable cold, utter darkness. Poisonous atmosphere of methane and ammonia. Yes, no light. As we understand it, I wonder. Another layer underneath. Gray like fused metal. And hard. I can't make a mark on it. It beats me how a thing like this came to be on the... What? Oh, yes. They said this happened before. Must be some kind of stored energy inside. What was I going to... I can't think, was it... Oh, it's cold. I suppose I ought to... What? What's that? How did it... get in? I must get through to... Man. Look at his hand. Gary, can you hear me? What happened? Oh, oh the mist. Cold. Oh, it's you, Doctor. My hand is burning. Has he burnt it? No, cold has done that. Extreme cold. I think it's come very near to being frostbitten. Here, take my jacket. Wrap his arm up in it. Peter, what was it? Why, oh, I, I was chipping the crust away. And then the humming started. The humming? It, it, came from 
from inside. Not not loud, but but I I couldn't think straight. And then suddenly there was, was a kind of kind of fog everywhere. Fog. I leaned against the cylinder, and it, it was like touching a red hot stove. And after that, I, I don't know. But you reached the alarm bell, laddie, and passed out. We saw that vapor too when we came in. Places like her refrigerator now. But outside, it's clear. Well, another mystery for our collection, Campbell. Your cosmic noise and now this. Hello. That's curious. What are you staring at? Well, that shelf. There were some things on it earlier. A couple of spare transformers, a pair of pliers. Has anyone moved them? I didn't. No one else has been down here. Well, perhaps I'm mistaken. But I could have sworn... I... Well, this is a remarkable find of yours, Clifford. Now we shall have to investigate it. Because I'm sure of one thing. It's not solid. There is something inside it. Later that night, we held a conference... The cylinder clearly possessed some disturbing properties. At Kirkuish, there were no facilities for investigating it thoroughly. But in my own modern laboratory at the college, well, with some regret, I proposed that we return to London and somehow take the cylinder with us. And McLaren agreed. He was as curious as myself, but could spare no more time from his study of the signals. Well, a lot of arranging had to be done. But Clifford and Elizabeth did their share, and three days later we left Skara on the island steamer. The cylinder went with us, cradled in straw and enclosed inside a stout crate. Even as I watched it being hoisted aboard at Kirkuish, the case swinging from the derrick had an oddly forbidding appearance. Why I should have felt that then, I... Oh, I don't know. But all the way back to Glasgow, it was just a confoundedly awkward piece of luggage. However, eventually we were relaxing on the express to London, with our trophies safely stowed in the luggage van at the rear of the train. Out of sight, but hardly out of mind. Peter Garrick was much better when we left. Yeah. The dock in the island thought he was lucky not to have lost his fingers. I don't get it, sir. What could have caused a sudden temperature drop like that? I've no idea, Clifford. But we mustn't go leaping to any science fiction conclusion. Possibly some freak condition peculiar to that cellar. And then the humming from the cylinder. Well, certain elements can resonate in magnetic fields. There was a lot of electrical equipment nearby. But there wasn't on that beach. And that mist... Something about the way it moved. It's the material that interests me. It, under the sea crust that Garrick chipped away, there was another layer, uh, rough and metallic. It, it reminded me of something, but... We're slowing down. Stopping. It can't be Carlisle yet. Well, I see your tickets, please. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you, sir. What have we stopped for, Inspector? Oh, seems they're having a little trouble up front with the locomotive. One of the new diesels, isn't it? Yes, but it hasn't been pulling properly for the last few miles. Yeah, I noticed that. Losing power, a motor fault, I suppose. If the motormen can't trace it, we'll have to get a relief sent up from Carlisle. We hope the delay won't be too long. Yes, I wonder. What is it, Doctor? Anything wrong? I don't know. These last few days... Perhaps I'm getting foolish ideas. Anyway, it won't do any harm to make sure. Will you two come with me? I'm going down to the luggage van. Sure. Just a moment, sir. Looking for something? You have a crate of mine in here, guard. Would you mind if we uh, take a look at it? That'll be all right. That big fellow, isn't it? Machinery of some sort. Machinery? What makes you think that? Oh, I heard a sort of humming sound noise some way back. Where? Oh, it seemed to be coming from the case. Oh. Thought perhaps some electrical gadget had managed to switch itself on. Stopped after a bit, though. Hey, here it is. Hasn't exploded anything. 
Just the same as it was when it came aboard at Glasgow. Cliff, it isn't. The crates are different color. Why is the wood white like that? Search me. Funny sort of weather, this. Of course, you get all sorts up north this time of year. But it turned so blooming cold in here about a quarter of an hour ago. I had to put my coat on. I nipped my ears, too. Oh, we're off again. It seems to be covered in some kind of powder. Oh, don't touch it again, my dear. Come away from it. That's not powder. It's frost. The rest of the journey after that was uneventful. At Euston, six porters heaved the crate onto a waiting lorry sent from the college, and we followed to Kensington in a taxi. The college was empty and echoing, as it always is in vacation time, and the smell of dust and age had come back into its own. With the aid of two boilermen and Simmons, the head caretaker, we took the crate up in the goods lift and dragged it through the silent corridors to my laboratory. It was late in the afternoon. We were tired. But any idea of waiting until the next day to begin work just didn't occur to us. We dismantled the crate and mounted the cylinder on a long workbench, wedging it with wooden blocks and arranged floodlights to work by. The first thing I did was to examine the place where Garrick had flaked away the white coating of sea growth. Yes. This was the surface before the Atlantic started on it, as it was probably when it first became submerged. Grey, hard, and honeycombed with small bubbles. From these streaks, I should say, traces of iron, copper, and nickel. It looks almost like a volcanic rock. Lava. No, no, this has been fused by a much higher temperature. Now, what... <gasps> yes, of course... I know where I've seen this before. On the surface of meteorites. Meteorites? But they get scorched up. Entering the Earth's atmosphere, yes. Well, the condition is similar. Uh, Clifford, uh, sir? get the keys from Simmons and go down to the engineering department. Okay. Find some mallets and chisels. The heavier, the better. What I want to know is, what is underneath this... four hours under those glaring lamps, we chipped away like three sculptors inspired. Only, we had no conception of what was taking shape under our tools. Beneath the outer crust was a solid layer, an inch thick, of fused mineral matter. When we had cleared one end of the cylinder, we attacked that. And that, too, we eventually got through to bare metal, bright silver. A metal cylinder. Our basic question was answered. It cannot have formed naturally. Whatever it was, it had been constructed. For a long time, we contemplated that smooth, gleaming surface. We had no suggestions, no theories. And then, and seemed the only thing to do, we began to enlarge the area we had uncovered. Outside, the lamps came on in Cromwell Road and theater-bound taxis hustled on their way. By eight o'clock, we had bared one entire end of the cylinder. There it lay, bright under the lights, like the end of a monstrous metal cigar case. At ten past eight, I laid my mallet and chisel on the bench. Well, no point in going on with this all night. It will take days to clear the whole service. And then the only way in will be with an oxyacetylene torch. Now, it's going to be a long job. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily one for us. How do you mean? Well, I'm beginning to wonder... Whether we meant to be risking blowing ourselves and the college sky high. 
Some wartime beauty, you mean, that got washed up on Scarra. Yeah, we thought of that on the beach. It's possible. I think first we ought to have an expert opinion, I suppose, the Ministry of Works of the people. But a bomb, a rusty mine, could that cause anything to happen now? I mean, what we saw? I don't know, Elizabeth. It, it seems about as sinister now as a stick of Brighton rock. Look, I think we should all go home. Tomorrow we'll... well, we'll reconsider it. Will you both be here at 11? Certainly. Mm. Good. Uh, put those lights out, will you, Elizabeth? Right. Here's your coat, Doctor. Thank you. We can leave everything as it is. You're coming, Clifford? Hmm? No. No, yeah. Sure. Don't forget your briefcase, please. No. Thanks for reminding me. We went down in the lift across the dark entrance hall with its spreading dome and enormous crystal chandelier. And I said goodnight to my students on the steps outside. Then I held a taxi to take me to my house in Eaton Square. Clifford and Elizabeth walked away towards South Kensington Tube Station. It began to rain. and Ten minutes later, I understand, they were sitting in a coffee bar in the Fulham Road. The sculptors keep at it. My chisel arm's stiffening up already. Well, what now? Half past eight. You could take me to the pictures if you like. A movie at this time? Liz, you surely can throw off the cares of the working day. No point in brooding over this. We have some unexplained phenomena, an unidentified object. It just means experimenting until we find the answers. Just like that. And I'm the one without imagination. Me, I keep thinking of that enormous great thing sitting up there like an overturned idol. Almost as if it's watching us. How silly. Just a slab of metal. Yeah. You know, Petrie didn't notice it. Could be just a scratch. On the other hand, if there is a way in... What do you mean? Well, I guess I should have mentioned it to the prof. I'm never going to sleep with this on my mind. And it won't take long to check. You coming? Where to? Back to the college. What, now? Yeah. Someone's will open up for me. Just a question of whether it's a line or a crack. A line or a crack? Yeah. Come on. Swing that lamp a bit this way, will you? All right? Yeah, yeah, fine. Hey. Hey, this is it, Liz. Do you see here? A thin line running right around the end of the cylinder. Ah, this wire's too thick. I know. Cigarette paper. That's it. Now, the thing is... Will it? Yeah, it slides in. It is a crack, and deep. In the end, this whole section must be... Wait, Cliff, listen. Someone's coming. Who could it be? Not Simmons, he doesn't walk like that. Shh, wait. Well, it would appear that great minds do think alike. Dr. Petrie, we had no idea you were... Coming back? Neither did I until I got home and tried to forget all this. What an odd thing curiosity is. For some reason, I felt this shouldn't wait. You do, I imagine. Well, not exactly, sir. I noticed this earlier on. What? This hairline around the circumference. I've tested it, and it's a crack. A crack? Yeah. So this whole end section could be kind of a plug. It could come off. Well done, Clifford. This is important. You see, it it won't move or turn. Yeah. But but there's something else here on the end face. Two holes about a foot apart. Yes. Sockets for a key. If we can find something to fit them. The engineering floor. Oh, of course. They have every kind of plate key down there. I'll be right back. All right, good man. Now, if this end is removable, 
It's been made so for a purpose. And that, Elizabeth, can only be... Because... Because there is something inside. Yes. It seemed an age before Clifford returned with an assortment of bright steel keys... We found one that fitted the sockets exactly. Even as I felt its grip, I hesitated. Should we go on? Should we take a calculated risk? Looking back on that night, I can understand why none of us seriously considered doing anything else. We understood so little then. Clifford and I hauled on the key... After a few seconds, the whole end of the cylinder began to turn. A few inches, and then it stuck. We threw our weight on it, and then it was turning freely. A fine, polished thread crept slowly into sight. The gap between the plug and the casing steadily widened. I think... I think we're nearly there. Better be ready to catch this when it comes clear. Yes, turn slowly, now. Elizabeth, stand back, please. Uh, could have stopped a moment. <coughs> Something wrong? I want to listen. Uh, escaping gas. Anything. No. Nothing. All right. Go on. Very slowly. Yeah. It's coming. Now hold it. Don't let it drop. I've got it. I'll let it down. Ah, uh, that's it. Elizabeth, quickly. Can you see anything? It's hollow. There's a cavity. But it seems to be empty. What? Yes. A hollow barrel about 18 inches across. Hey, look at the thickness of that casing. Nine inches of solid metal at least. This doesn't go in very far. There's something blocking it. Elizabeth, bring that lamp down here. That's it. Now. Yes. The hole goes in for about a foot, and then just a shiny surface. It looks like glass. Green. Listen. There it is. That humming. Is that what you heard before? Yes, but much louder. I don't understand it. This enormous thing and nothing inside, but... Unless... uh, Bring the lamp nearer. Nearer, nearer. Yes. It must be. Well, what else can there be? There's no other way in. But don't you see? That green substance, it's solid. And it isn't attached to the casing. It must run the full length inside. You mean... The cylinder is just a shell, a container, to protect some kind of inner core, something green and hard. Polished to a perfect fit that could be slid in. And then the casing capped and sealed, and that'll keep it intact for, well, any sort of journey. If it went in like that... It should come out the same way. Doctor, you said a journey. How long a journey? Where's this thing come from? I don't know, Elizabeth, and at the moment we'd better not speculate. We can't turn back now. We must know the truth for, well, for better or worse. But how can we drag it out? There's nothing to get a grip on. Uh, There might be a way. Yes, look, that roof span up there, some chain and a pulley. Yeah, upend the casing and lift it off. It's the only way. Come on. We worked feverishly into the early hours. Again, we raided the engineering department, dragging up hooks, chains, and pulley blocks. We rigged a tackle over the cylinder, attaching the block to the steel span which crossed overhead, and shackled the lifting chain securely round and closed the end. And all the time, the thing on the bench continued to hum, softly and insistently. The chains swung and tightened. Slowly, the massive cylinder reared upright on the bench. There was a terrifying moment when it rocked and almost toppled, but then it settled firmly on its open end. There was a slither and a thud. The core had shifted. We went on dragging at the chain... The pulley clattered and our hands became slippery with grease. 
With nerve-wracking slowness, the casing rose, exposing inch by inch the thing it contained and guarded. It was a rod, an enormous green rod. It was solid and transparent. But embedded in it was a fantastic tracery of fine silvery wires, a glittering spider's web of strange branching patterns, and every gleaming vein converged to one point, a hollow cavity in the heart of the crystalline mass, a round bubble containing something gray and bulbous, something that looked like a fine sponge. Something which expanded and contracted rhythmically, pulsing with fierce, vital energy. That was Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes, written by Peter Elliot Hayes, and produced for the BBC by David Davis. From London, we present Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode 3, The Power. This is Tom Lambert again. You have now heard two of the tape recordings made by Dr. Petrie. His account of bringing the strange corroded cylinder found beneath a Hebridean beach to London, how it was found to be hollow, and the way in which Petrie and his two students lifted off the outer casing to discover, well, perhaps I may repeat the doctor's own words, a transparent green rod, solid, but embedded in it a fantastic tracery of fine silvery wires, and every gleaming vein converging to a hollow cavity, a bubble containing something like a sponge, something that pulsed with vital energy. There now we rejoined them in the college laboratory, three in the morning, their eyes fixed, fascinated, on the thing on the bench. Here is the third recording. Notes, reel three. So now we knew. This was what had lain under the sand all those years, with the grey Atlantic washing to and fro above it. It was an incredible object we stared at, but it had beauty too, that limpid green pillar with its gossamer tracery of metal threads. We stayed there talking for a while. I made a mental note to get in touch in the morning with the head of the college, Sir Edward Bancroft. He was a physicist. I thought it would interest him. Then I locked the double laboratory doors. We walked to the lift, and once again we descended to the darkened entrance hall. There was no sound in the whole of the sprawling, empty building. And yet... As we reached the doors, there was something else. Elizabeth heard it first. Doctor, what's that? That ding ding sound. Seems to be coming from somewhere overhead. Yes, it's in the dome, I think. I can feel something, too, a kind of vibration. Good heavens, look, it, it's the chandelier. The whole thing's quivering. It, it started to swing. Something's shaking the whole building. Yes, that's that. Lifting down. The ground is dropping. Ah! We raced back to the laboratory. There, a scene from a nightmare met us. The whole room had changed. The floors, the walls, every piece of apparatus, everything was furred with crisp, glinting frost. A bitter cold pricked our faces. But the frost was not white. It was a livid green, colored by the light that glared from the rod on the bench. Then, nearer suddenly... Something swirled, grey and curling. It was a swathe of mist, appearing from nowhere. Then another, and another. It was twisting, thickening between us. Across the laboratory on the far wall, 
a black line suddenly snaked and forked. A crack. It opened steadily, gaped. And then the oak workbench beneath the rod seemed to crumble and dissolve. The rod lurched, toppled, and as it fell, the entire laboratory floor sagged and collapsed, leaving a vast yawning abyss. The rod, still flaring, plunged through. yourself this time. Oh, I wish your department could find other ways of bringing its work to my notice. Oh, there was a bomb through the roof in the wall. It didn't make half this mess. Forty-foot hole up there. And that's for the lecture theater here. No, I can't say how sorry I am, Edward. To say now, I, I don't know what happened. Well, it's... Well, it's, it's, it's the truth. I've told you what little we know. What that cylinder is, how it functions. I confess I've no clear idea as for all this mess, well, we've seen it can resonate powerfully and set up severe vibrations. Yeah. Somehow, I suppose, they found structural weaknesses in the building. Cracks started. We saw them opening. And then the floor gave way. Now, wait, Hayward. This isn't a barn full of dry rot. These floors are reinforced concrete. I know that. That exhibit of yours came through like a 16-inch shell. Look at those girders sheared through like so many cucumbers. And the bench it was standing on, we haven't found a trace of it. But... A lot of grey dust. Yeah. It's a strange business, Edward. And the rod itself. Not even cracked. When we get it out, we must arrange precautions and close it somehow. In its cylinder for the time being, and then... Well, I... I, I don't know. Yes. Well, we can't afford too many experiments on this scale. No, but we must go at this systematically. Take readings, samples, and above all, watch. Yes. Well, I want to know the answers to this, Hayward, however disturbing they may be. I think you understand. Yes, yes. Excuse me, gentlemen. Hmm? Good morning. Uh, may I have a word? Well? I believe, sir, you're Dr. Petrie. Yes. And who, young man, might you be? I don't care for the look of that notebook. Oh, it's pretty harmless if you don't tease it. Uh, Tom Lambert. Here's my press card. Huh? Uh, uh, we had a report there'd been an explosion here. There has been no explosion. Well, what's all this, then? Death Watch Beetle? An experiment, Got out of control. A floor gave way. That is all, Mr. Lambert. A floor gave way. Oh. And the chandelier in the entrance hall, another experiment? Yes, it, it, it fell. The chain was rusted away. The vibration... The vibration. Yes, I see. Uh, uh, vibration. And, um, that green object sticking out of the wreckage, a part of the experiment? I... I don't wish to say any more about it at the moment. You're doing secret work here while the students are away. I didn't say that. Look, Doctor, I write a popular science column. Oh. I was on the phone yesterday to Professor Campbell McLaren on the island of Skara. What for? Well, I wanted to do an article about the radio telescope. He mentioned in passing an interesting thing. That you had made a rather curious find up there and brought it back to London. Now, that green thing, I suppose that wouldn't be it. You can suppose just what you like, Mr. Lambert. Okay, perhaps you won't mind if I clamber over and just take a quick deco. If you do, young man, I shall not hesitate to take my walking stick to your back. Furthermore, unless you remove yourself from these premises in two minutes flat, I'll have you thrown out. Do I make myself clear? Okay, if that's how you feel about it. But we appreciate cooperation and we appreciate privacy. All right, all right. But you know, gentlemen, newspapers are like elephants. They don't forget. Every news item is filed. We have uh, quite a system. Useful for looking up odd things. If you ever want me, you'll know where to find me. Good morning. Well, I'm blessed. By late afternoon, we succeeded in replacing the green rod in its casing and screwing home the plug. So dull and harmless now, it seemed impossible that... Uh, however, that evening I invited Elizabeth and Clifford to dinner at my house. For three hours we discussed the problem and were no wiser when we'd finished. Then I remembered a note my housekeeper said had been delivered by messenger earlier. 
I opened it. Inside was a column cut from a newspaper and a visiting card. The name, Thomas Lambert. A date was typed on the clipping, January 1952. And it made curious reading. I handed it over to Clifford. Oh, more disturbance in disused pit. Families living near the abandoned Lanwithlin Colliery in the Rhonda Valley are again wondering what's happening a mile below their back gardens. For the third time in five years, unaccountable rumbling sounds have been heard inside the old workings, which were discontinued in 1945. Coal board experts say subsidences are to be expected, but veteran miners shake their heads. Lanwithlin, they say, has always been a wicked pit. They have not forgotten the disastrous collapses that occurred in 1907, 1917, and again in 1927. And there are other sounds that puzzle even the experts. Rumbling sounds. Ah, so an old coal mine is caving in. What does Lambert expect us to do about that? Well, I imagine to connect them with... Uh, well, there is some slight similarity to the things we've observed. True. But nothing significant. Why should Lambert suppose there could be... I suppose I'd better telephone him in the morning, if only to get rid of him. Now, Clifford, what I propose is this. A new laminated plastic has recently been developed. It's called Densolite. Uh -huh. It's light, almost transparent, and it effectively screens most known forms of radiation. Well, I intend to have a cabinet made, a cubicle to house the rod, made entirely of Densolite. Good idea. I know a firm will do it. Then we can study it in safety. It will be harmless enough inside two inches of densolite. Well, let's hope so. I think we'd better make a sketch of what we need. If you'll find some paper on the desk, sir. I'll get it, sir. The next morning was bright and frosty. We spent it at a small factory in Wembley, which manufactured laboratory apparatus. We were promised a Densolite cubicle to my exact requirements in three days. I left Clifford and Elizabeth at Hyde Park and went home. Then I remembered about telephoning Thomas Lambert. Reluctantly, I did. And another part of the weird pattern began to fall into place. That's all right, Doctor. Thought you might be interested, though. I started digging through our files again. Again? Oh, yeah. For two years now, I've been doing a little uh, research of my own. I have some notes I'd like you to see. Uh, but the first thing is, when shall we go? Go? Go where? Then Withlin, South Wales. There are two buses a day from Swansea. Now, look, Lambert, I'm not rushing off on wild goose chases on the strength of some bumps in a Welsh coal mine. Dr. Petrie, I went down that pit in 1952. I heard those bumps. They've started again recently. I have a feeling you wouldn't be wasting your time. A anyway, look. I'll be at Paddington Station at 7.30 tomorrow. There's a Cardiff train at 7.55. If you're not there, well, I'll go home and write about chemical fertilizers. Goodbye. Uh, Lambert. Well, I've met some irritating young men, but... Oh. I was annoyed with myself, but of course I was at Paddington the next morning. So was Lambert, cheerful and unapologetic. In the dining car, he opened a briefcase and showed me a pile of press cuttings, some of them already turning yellow. They were certainly of some interest. All reports of vague phenomena similar to the one that he had sent me. Lincolnshire, North Devon, Westmoreland, Kent. Conflicting, contradictory, inconsistent. A scrapbook of rumours, tall stories and sensation hunting. Now, that being so, why... Why was I beginning to feel so curiously uneasy? At four o'clock, we alighted from a country bus at Lanetri. A bitter wind slanted down the bleak mining valley, across the slate roof terraces and earth tips, giant conical molehills overgrown with weed. The spidery wheel over the Lanwetlin pithead was still. No steam came from the black chimney of the winch house. Lambert and I had picked our way among oily puddles and found the pit keeper in the old flint store hut where once the miners had collected their helmets and safety lamps. We explained who we were and what we'd come for, 
Mr. Morgan did not seem over-impressed. The noises again, is it? To, to the old pit will be famous if this keeps up indeed. Gentlemen from the coal board with black suits and bowler hats. Lovely they were. And reporters. And even a lady from the BBC. Talked beautiful, just like the wire she did. Well, she's been quiet today. <coughs> the old pit, you know. And quiet she was yesterday. Yes. Yes, it's about now she will start. If she's going to. Mr. Morgan took us to the pit head. Through an iron door in the brick wall that had been built round it. Then we were gazing down into the shaft, square and narrow, dropping away into echoing darkness. For over an hour we stood and shivered, while Mr. Morgan rolled stringy-looking cigarettes, smoked them, and threw them into the pit as if it were his own private ashtray. Well, then I'd had enough and said so. Lambert shrugged. We were just turning away. There she goes. Never quiet now for more than a few days, see? Don't stand too near the edge, man. The shake will be coming in a minute. Here it is. Feel it, Doctor. The vibration. That's coming from at least half a mile down. Well, does it remind you of anything? What do you expect me to say, Lambert? That's what it could be. Anything. Could it? And that. Listen carefully. Yes. There is another sound. Some resemblance, I suppose, to... To what your students heard on the Isle of Skara. Doctor, is it the same? The call board gentlemen think it's water in the old working. Flooding, bringing down the galleries. But I'm not so sure. Well, something happens down there. You can feel... Hey, hold it! Yeah, that, I think it was. And another crack in the shaft wall. I shall have to report that three copies. What are you staring at, Doctor? I thought you weren't impressed. That crack. The way it suddenly opened. That's something I have seen before. Hmm. Well, seems to be over. Yes. Well, if we move, maybe we can get the same bus back to Swansea. Oh, then they lock up. Oh, some tales are told about Lambeth Limpit. For years I worked here on the coal face when I was a lad. And my old dad, he cut coal all his life down there. Look, Mr. Morgan. I could tell you things, man. Uh, perhaps another time. My old dad, you see, he was one of the first to get a real look. The light. Mr. Morgan, the bus. Oh, oh, the bus. Yes, yes, yes. You must be going. Lambert, wait. Hmm? Light, Mr. Morgan, in the mine, what sort of light? Well, man, I don't know whether it was his eyesight or the four ale bar of the miner's rest, but he used to swear, solemn, that a coal seam in the east working used to light up sometimes with a creepy green light that hurt you to look at it. Creepy green light. My first action next day after parting from Lambert at Paddington was to go and look at the cylinder now lying in the college basement in Kensington. Still, silent, it seemed harmless enough. I went up to my study and sat there alone for some time. I had much food for thought. Then I made one telephone call to an old colleague of mine, Dr. Trevor Hughes of Cardiff University. He promised if he could find the time to make certain inquiries for me. Then the growing jungle of papers on my desk brought me back to earth, so I forced recent events from my mind and got down to it. But it wasn't easy with the sounds of the workmen a few rooms away repairing my shattered laboratory. It was a week later that our examination of the cylinder began in earnest. By that time, the Densolite cubicle had arrived. Something between a massive telephone kiosk and an upended greenhouse Thick slabs of denser light riveted together, one hinged to form a door that could be secured on the outside with a steel bar. The cylinders hauled up from the basement, the rod again extracted, and installed upright in the cabinet. When we at last dropped the securing bar into place, the whole thing looked exactly like some odd museum exhibit in a glass case. We arranged instruments to detect and record sound, temperature, and radioactivity... The days passed. The recording pens drew only monotonous straight red lines on the creeping graph paper. 
The meter needles didn't as much as flicker. We sketched and photographed the embedded wiring system from every angle and pored over it for hours. I even entered the cubicle and attempted to break away a fragment of the rod for analysis. But my mallet glanced off the gleaming surface without leaving a scratch. Oh, it's no good. It's quite incredibly hard. Close the cubicle, Clifford. Okay. I tried a surface analysis. I couldn't get any sort of reaction. Yes. An unknown substance. An unknown function. Well, all we can do now is watch and keep on watching. Yeah, we could take it in shifts. Keep up observation all around the clock. Yes. The moment anything starts to happen, someone must be on hand to report it. Apart from the denser light, the rod is in the open again, unshielded by its cylinder. Will you help out a little bit? Yes, of course. We'll make my study our headquarters, yes? and for safety's sake, we'll fix up an electric buzzer which can be sounded from here, just in case of in case of emergency. Mm, good. Then we'll work out a duty rotor and keep an instrument reading log. Got a combined operation. Well, we've seen once what can happen. We must be ready. Our only chance of understanding more about this is to see it in operation. And hope the dense light is all it's claimed to be. Yes. That's something we must take a chance on. And from now on, no one is to go into the cubicle. That bar is not to be lifted for any reason. I had a camp bed put in my study and took up permanent residence there. The three of us kept our vigil in six-hour shifts, living on flasks of hot coffee and sandwiches. It was a thankless routine, but it had to be done. The next entry in my notes is for Thursday, the 19th of November. Yes, that Thursday night. It was round about 11 o'clock. Clifford was on duty in the laboratory, nearing the end of his watch. Elizabeth Ryder and I were working together in my study. She'd come off duty earlier in the evening, but had declined to go home. Outside, it was raining steadily. The lamps in Cromwell Road had damp halos round them. I was going over my notes, and Elizabeth, as I recall, was browsing through a ponderous textbook she had illicitly removed from the college library. How's it going, Doctor? Well, I've been cataloguing all the data we've collected so far about the cylinder. Not a lot, but... Well, have a look at it. Read it out. Right. A. It is extraordinarily hard. Yes. Composition, we might say, unknown. Go on. B. It clearly requires energy to operate and to find it. Yes, but there is no visible source of power. Hmm. Right. C, it can emit light. It can indeed, and very powerfully. D, it can produce drastic temperature changes. But always, as we've seen, in sudden drops to many degrees below freezing point. Right, next. E, it can vibrate, ranging from a mild hum to a very violent pulsation. Yes, we certainly know all about that. There's one more, F, the vapor or mist. Yes, the most mysterious characteristic. Is it caused by the other functions, or is it in some way given out by the cylinder? That seems out of the question. There are no vents or holes in the surface to release it. And when it comes, it forms so rapidly. Quite so. Well, that's the lot. Data? No. Just a string of unanswered questions. Elizabeth, are we chasing shadows? Are we dealing in fact or a fiction of our own making? How do you mean? Well, we need a theory? All right. That rod is an electronic device. Yes. Possibly a component of something bigger. Medical apparatus, perhaps. Ah. It fell overboard from some vessel. In time, it was washed ashore on Skara. The action of the tide buried it. It's nothing we recognize or understand, but do we know of every scientific advance made in other countries? No. Well... Well, you see, without a grain of evidence, we promptly start indulging in all manner of sinister forebodings. 
And we call ourselves scientists. I suppose, looking at it like that, but there was something else. What's that? It's not on your list. I didn't think I left anything out. Why do you look like that? That night, when we went in there and found everything white with frost, just before the floor fell in, I don't know if it happened to you or Clifford. What? For a few moments, my mind went quite blank. Go on. I knew where I was, but I couldn't say or do anything. And there was something about that dreadful noise I wanted to listen to. Some part of it that seemed to mean something. Yes, I saw you. You were staring right into that green glare, but your eyes were not seeing it. I can't explain it. But there's not much we can explain, is there? Oh, you were nearest to it. What's that book you've been looking at? Oh, uh, Weather's the Human Machine. Physiology. A little out of our field. It's that organism inside the rod that puzzled me. I thought perhaps... Oh, but this will take me a year to read. No, wait a moment. Don't close it. That plate. That illustration. What chapter is that? The brain and central nervous system. Elizabeth, look at it. The formation. The structure. Even the color. It can't be. This is a specimen of the you... Doctor! The buzzer from the lab! They must be Clifford. This can wait. Come on! The 30 yards to the laboratory seemed a mile. We heard the noise before we got there. And when we burst in, the same cold bittered our faces and the same flaring green light stabbed our eyes. Clifford was leaning against a bench, one hand shielding his face, the other pointing urgently at the cubicle. Inside, the rod had come alive once more, a mass of shimmering green luminescence. But there was a change. Now it glowed like the heart of a furnace through swirling grey vapour that choked the cabinet pressing thickly against the denser light slabs. And inside that green inferno, something moved. I've known he started up a minute ago. No warning. It was just a flip on the meters. And... Well, look at that paper. And... The denser light's containing it, thank heaven, keeping it in. We should be safe enough. But what is that moving inside? It's a lamp. A lamp? Yeah. yeah one of those jointed steel jobs off the bench. Check what on earth is it doing in there? I said the cubicle was not to be opened. Yeah, well, I, I skipped the order. I put it in. Just trying out a screwy idea that the rod seems to have some effect on solids. And I thought, well, maybe this would be some kind of test. But that lamp must weigh all of 15 pounds. And it's being whirled about like a feather. It's hard to see properly, but am I imagining it? Or is it getting smaller? Oh, it's smoke, Liz, you're right. It is. Fascinated, disbelieving, we watched and we saw a miracle. The heavy metal lamp, shade, bulb, stand, and base, dwindled and dwindled in size as it whirled like a straw in the wind. Weightless in the gray vapor, it shrank to a half-size model, keeping its shape perfectly, to a beautiful toy, to a tiny piece of doll's house furniture, and at last to a black speck that danced for a few seconds and then vanished against the glowing surface of the rod. Here was our answer. To the boiling sea on Skara, to the missing object on the shelf, to the bench that became nothing, and the steel and concrete floor that suddenly opened. Here was the truth beyond science, beyond understanding. The rod had one monstrous, unimaginable power. Utterly and completely... It could absorb solid matter. That was Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes. Written by Peter Elliot Hayes. From 
London, we present Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode four, The Voices. This is Tom Lambert again. You've now heard three of the six tape recordings made by Dr. Hayward Petrie. But on that November night in the college laboratory, when the green rod went into action for the second time, we were very far from halfway to the truth. Even as the three of them watched a solid steel lamp dwindle and vanish into the cylinder, they could not dream of what was yet to come. But Dr. Petrie must take up the story for himself. Here is the fourth recording. Continuation of notes, reel four. If I had watched it alone, I would have disbelieved my own eyes. But we all saw it. That heavy, jointed lamp shrink to a speck and then literally suck into the glowing core of the rod. Almost at once, the disturbance, noise, light, vibration began to subside. Look, do you see? The light's dimming. And the mist in the cubicle is clearing. But... There's no way for it to get off. It doesn't need a way out. It's being reabsorbed into the rod where it came from. There's nothing else in there. The lamp's gone completely. And we wondered what power that thing possessed. Now we know. Yes. It can absorb solid matter. No. Those objects missing from the shelf are curcuish. Of course. The way the workbench that thing was standing on seemed to vanish. The dust that was left, they... Well, they went. The same way as that lamp. But it's impossible. Solids, gases can't pass through each other. It's a question of densities. It's a law of physics. Well, one of our laws, perhaps... But must they apply everywhere? Under sufficient pressure, water can be passed through a steel plate. A solid can pass through a gas. But a splinter of superfrozen hydrogen can be driven into a wooden board. It's all a question of applied forces. We only understand these things in, in our own terms. Yes, sir, but physical and chemical changes always leave something, some deposit. Yes. Look at the rod now. It's gone quite dull. You can see through it again. They can. Just the wires and the gray thing in the center. Nothing else. No, nothing else. But that lamp just can't disappear off the face of the earth. Can't it? After tonight, who are we to say what's impossible? Thank heaven we had that cabinet made. If, if this had happened in the open. Yes. It seems to work more powerfully each time. Now listen, both of you. I repeat what I said three days ago. And this time I mean it. After this, we must never open that cubicle. Not for any reason. No. All right. If solid matter can be drawn in, it could be, well, extremely dangerous. Doctor. Yes. The book I was looking at, before Cliff sounded the buzzer, that illustration, I think you're right. Yes, that organism in the center, it has all the same characteristics, only on a much larger scale. The resemblance is perfect. And the photograph was of human nerve cells. Yes, each one, perhaps one ten thousandth of an inch in diameter. But the cells that thing is made up of must be a quarter of an inch across. If that material comes from some kind of living being, for some reason, in some way, enclosed, sealed in, well, the mind staggers at the possibilities. Don't you realize it's simply a question of scale? A human, if he were composed of cells that size, would be... He'd be almost three miles high. <laughs> Later that night, leaving Clifford and Elizabeth on watch, I went alone to my study. I wanted to think. This had suddenly become something far larger than a laboratory problem. This powerful, ruthless mechanism, lying buried for years beneath a Hebridean beach with the sea washing indifferently over it, how had it got there, and more vital, where had it begun its existence? At last, I picked up the telephone and called Sir Edward Bancroft at his home in Kent. Edward made no comment, as I told him the fact. When I'd finished, he told me to come down to Westrum at once and bring my students with me. I wonder now if either of us realized that it was three in the morning. I shall always remember that drive through the wet, empty suburbs and later through the black, sunny lanes. And at 4.30, we were sitting in Edward's panel drawing room around the ashes of a dead fire with the first grey of dawn coming over the Kent Hills. 
You were in the pajamas and dressing gown, weren't you? Yes, sir. Sent you to receive guests like this. But guests usually come at a respectable hour. Well, Ed, yes, sorry. My wife's making coffee. We'll be here in a minute. Perhaps I should have waited until the morning. No, you did quite right, Hayward. Well, at least you didn't write off the college completely. Not quite. And these are the readings you collected. Yes, hmm? sir. Radiation level reached five runtions. Temperature down to minus 11 in 80 seconds. Vibrations up to 12,000 cycles. Hmm. Quite a lively little gadget, isn't it? And we lost a lamp. Yes. Look, Hayward, it's no good our thinking up glib explanations and sticking our heads in the sand. I'm in touch with technological advances pretty well everywhere. And I can tell you that no one has produced anything like this. So, we're forced to consider the possible alternative. That the cylinder did not originate on this planet. Not a new idea to you, perhaps. No, it's not. We've shot umpteen satellites into space. Some of them have stayed up. Some of them haven't. But what do we know about what comes into our own planetary back garden? Practically nothing. I agree. This could be our first contact with some other intelligence. Yes. The thing probably isn't meant to do any harm. It may be just a complex instrument, hopelessly out of its element, running wild. Imagine Sputnik 99 thumping down on Venus and disgorging sparks, radio signals, and guinea pigs. The inhabitants, if any, would be quite justified in taking a sledgehammer to it and asking questions afterwards. This could be something like that. Yes, but where in the solar system could it have come from? The composition of the planets is well known. None of them can support the kind of life to bring off an achievement like this. And I think, sir, our cylinder can bite a little harder than the average guinea pig. It can. And it'll take more than a sledgehammer to even chip it. Yes, so you'll see. We have indeed. Well, none of us is qualified to make decisions on this. In the morning, I shall give Charles a ring. Charles? Lord Heatherton, the Minister of Science. Oh, of course. Lives in Whitehall somewhere. We're getting a little out of our depth, Hayward. I'm afraid officialdom must take over. Yes, but what, whatever happens, I must have facilities to continue studying that rod. I, 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 I can't stop now. Well, I know, Charles, you have every facility. And the cylinder for the moment seems safe enough where it is. Oh. Don't look so glum, all of you. You may have made the most important discovery in the history of our world. Oh, I hope so, Edward, but... Uh... Oh, I don't know. I just wish there wasn't something about that thing that makes me want to throw it back into the sea. That's not like you, Hayward. You're tired. Been going at it too hard. Perhaps. We must take this one careful step at a time. Ah, here's that copy. Yes, poor old Heatherton. Cambridge, he was just rotten and high on that. I reached home as my housekeeper was laying breakfast. If my unshaven, disheveled appearance was a shock for her, there was one waiting for me, too. Almost at once, the telephone rang. Oh, Cardiff University? Yes, this is Dr. Petrie. Thank you. Hello? Good morning, Hayward. Morning. Trevor Hughes here. Good. Did I get you out of bed? No, you didn't. Good, good. How is Welsh Wales this morning? Old and damp, but better than London any day. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what? Yes. You asked me to have a look at that colliery, uh, Slan, uh, Slan Wesleyan in the Romba. Yes, of course. Now, have I wasted your time? I got a group of my students doing some detecting. Ones who come from that part. Hold on. I have a good mind to advise the dean to send them down, every mother's son of them. Why, what have they done? A couple of them were keen potholers. They thought this was too good to miss. Worse, one of them had worked in a pit. Well... They went to San Westin, but everything seemed quiet enough, including the pit keeper who was having a sleep. Of course, there was no way of getting down the old shaft, but did that discourage them? The idiots went down their way. Potholing gear, ropes, lamps, and all the rest. They ought to be shot. Believe it or not, they got down to the level of the first working and went half a mile into the galleries. Good for them. Good for... Uh, uh, sorry, I, I mean a very uh, foolhardy of them. Mad as hatters. Yes. Yeah. Luckily, the pit is still in quite good shape except for a few small collapses and a little flooding. But at the very end of the east working, hey, but they, they say they found a kind of cavern. Oh, yes? It must have formed since the pit was closed. And then, clambering about with their lamps, they, they found uh, something else. What? What did they find? An object covered in mineral deposits sticking out of the debris. A tubular, seven or eight feet long, they described it as, as some sort of cylinder. Oh. So it's not the only one. They didn't, uh, try to move it? No, the air was foul. They had to come up. Thank heaven for that. Now, Trevor, I, I can't explain it all now, but 
They must not go down again. We have a similar object here in the college. We... What? Yes, and we don't know what it may be. Have you been climbing down coal mines at your age? No. No, this was found on an island in the Hebrides. Now we know of two. Good heavens. I'll call you later, Trevor. All right, yes, yes. And uh, those students of yours, oh? be strict with them. Get them sent down, definitely. Yes, I, I, I should, of course. On the other hand, one could say they showed a good sense of initiative. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, nothing. Thanks for your help. Goodbye. Shortly afterwards, the telephone rang again. It was Sir Edward Bancroft. He told me he'd arranged an appointment for me with the Minister of Science, four o'clock that afternoon in Whitehall. A cloud of uncertainty was gathering in my mind, a dark, forbidding cloud. And I knew then where the answer lay. I went to Fleet Street, to Tom Lambert. Well, Doctor, are we in business, or aren't we? Yes, Lambert, I owe you an apology. No, not at all. You were right to drag me down to Van Wetland. After this, I'll respect journalistic intuition. <laughs> there is another cylinder in that pit. There is? Yes. It was found yesterday. <laughs> well, it was a shot in the dark, but I've had my eye on this longer than you have, Doctor. You know, years ago, I began noticing the way similar reports kept turning up. Yes? Well, I hadn't a ghost of a theory for them, but what's a journalist smells a mystery? Oh, I know. Well, anyway, I started a private news library. Just so, and that's why I came. Huh? You showed me some cuttings on the train to Wales. There were about seven, I remember. Yeah, but they were only a few of them. A few? Oh, didn't I make that clear? No. How, uh, how many more are there? <sighs> You'd better see the file. All of it. Should be in here. And I've only been a bit for a few years. Here we are. Oh, it's very thick. Uh-huh. One cutting dated 1907. Mystery earth tremors in Lincolnshire. 1919. Strike at Kent Quarry. Narrow escapes as fissure opens. 1929. Frostbite in midsummer. Strange sounds on x And plenty more going back for 50 years. 40 accounts in all. 40? And they all have a familiar ring, don't they, Doctor? Maybe even this isn't the whole story. Look, turn to the last sheet. One I came across by accident when I was in Jordan last year. Syrian village devastated. Humming heard as ground subsides. Green light. Vibration felt in Damascus. Oh, yeah. And early this year, a half-finished block of flats in Belgrade collapsed without warning. Again, the ground just caved in. And again, workmen talked about a green light. Does that mean anything? Yes, of course you will. You don't know, the, the cylinder in our laboratory emits a green light when it functions. Good heavens. Yes. Syria, Yugoslavia, there could be others, perhaps all over the world. Oh. Lambert, this is vitally important. All such reports everywhere. Can we get hold of them? Mm, it's all order. The world's a fair-sized place, you know. Yeah, but the press association's not so little. If I can get my editor on our side, and the foreign news agencies would play... We can try. I think I can get you official backing for it. I'm seeing Lord Heatherton this afternoon. The minister? Is it that high already? Yes. Look, may I borrow this file of yours? I think he ought to see it. Yeah, it's all yours. <laughs> and I just hope that one day that lot might make a new story. It may yet. Looks like something pretty big, doesn't it, Doctor? Bigger, perhaps, than we can even imagine. <laughs> At four o'clock, I was sitting in a long, high room behind Whitehall. A log crackled in an Adam fireplace, its flames reflecting darkly on the disdainful portraits on the walls. Beyond the tall window, a tug hooted on the grey curve of the Thames. Lord Heatherton seemed a quiet, mild-looking man, until his blue eyes suddenly sharpened, and then you felt a powerful mental microscope focusing on you. Interesting, Dr. Petrie, there. Disturbing, perhaps. But would you say conclusive, any of it? Well, there's no actual proof of what we suspect. Right. Then you're not a crank. No, sir. Well, now, you've given me the technical data, your notes. Methodical, as I expected they would be. And I've talked with Bancroft, and he takes it seriously. Now, tell me what you think, Doctor. Just what you consider we are up against. Well, I can summarize. We know of the certain existence of two cylinders. They can cause violent physical disturbances. They can also assimilate mineral and metallic substances. 
probably any solid matter. How do they do it? I want your theory. Possibly by some means of compressing molecular structures. This could account for the extraordinary shrinking process we have observed. When the object is sufficiently condensed, it passes into the interior of the rod and is absorbed. You might say it's digested without trace. But this is not limited to single objects. No. Beneath the ground, the cylinders absorb quantities of whatever strata around them, soil, rock, sand, and submerged, I believe they even take in seawater. They seem to have quite an appetite mm. and some curious taste. Um, but this would require energy a, a great deal. Where do they obtain it? It may well be that they can absorb that, too, from any nearby source. Dynamos, electric lines, possibly even heat. There was an occasion when an express diesel engine became drained of power. And at the college, since we've had the thing in the laboratory, the lights often grow dim and the electric lifts work sluggishly. You mean they can recharge themselves at will? Through solid walls? Uh, across distances? It's the only answer. And when they're replenished, they can operate again. That's when the dangerous freezings occur. I see. There are these news reports. Do you seriously believe that each one means uh, another cylinder? Well, not in every case, perhaps, but I think we must accept the existence of, well, a considerable number. Mm. Europe, the Middle East, a network of them. Where does one begin to grasp a thing like this? Huh? Uh, and you are trying to trace all reports that fit the known pattern. Yes. It may take some time. It must be done quickly. I will talk to the Press Association myself. Until we know how far this goes, if the results are significant, some of the sites will have to be excavated. Until then, carry on with your work, Doctor. You will have my ministry's full support. Thank you, sir. Uh, money if you need it. Thank you. It's not meter readings I want. I want to know why. What their purpose is. And now, what is nowadays known as the $64,000 question. Where have they come from, Doctor? You tell me. Very well. I believe they've traveled here from some source in space. They've been guided, directed to bury themselves in out-of-the-way places. They're part of a plan, an operation, devised by an extremely advanced intelligence. They've been falling on Earth for at least 50 years, possibly for very much longer. It seems safe to assume, therefore that they're still arriving. It was coming nearer. At last we were beginning to glimpse the vast outline which only too soon was to become dreadfully clear. And things were not only happening in London... Since our return, we'd had too much to occupy us to give much thought to where it had all begun, the radio telescope on the Isle of Scala. But on that desolate headland in the control room beneath the huge brooding bowl, McLaren and Garrick were making discoveries of their own. We are still a long way from breaking down the signals themselves, but you check the calculations yourself, sir. What conclusion would you come to? The signals faded steadily for six months. Now they're growing stronger again. The source moving away from us. And coming back. Yes. And these progressions are regular. Yes. That means the motion of the point of origin is curved. An arc. And an arc is part of a circle. Or an ellipse. An ellipse. And that can only mean one thing. An orbit. Yes. These transmissions are coming from a solid body orbiting round the sun like a planet, somewhere beyond Pluto. Nine planets and... Hmm. Peter, do you realize what this could be? Yes, what every astronomer has been wondering since Pluto was discovered in 1930. Yes. Well, the universities must see these figures and... No, I must discuss this with Peter first. We need his opinion. I'll send him a telegram and go down to London for a few days. Right, sir. I uh, rather want to see what he's making of that wee souvenir he took home with him. Late the next afternoon, I sent Clifford and Elizabeth away from the laboratory. I wanted to study my notes alone, and there now seemed no purpose in watching the silent cylinder all the time. Also, Elizabeth seemed to be growing more depressed each day, as if something were weighing on her mind. 
She and Clifford retired rather discouraged, probably to spend the evening at their usual coffee bar, and I went home. At about 11 o'clock that night in my study in Eaton Square, I was examining a thick folder of calculations and diagrams. Professor McLaren, who had arrived with it an hour before, watched me curiously. Well, is it or isn't it? Campbell, I want to be the first to congratulate you. These figures are conclusive. A large orbiting body within the solar system. There can be only one explanation. A new tenth planet. Orbit one zero. That's it. It's been suspected for years. A planet so distant, so dark, that no telescope, even yours, can detect it. No. No, we would never have known without those signals. But that's where they're coming from, Hayward. Signals from the tenth planet. It must be enormous, possibly even larger than Jupiter. A vast, frozen giant. And its journey around the sun must take something like 700 years. I wonder, Campbell. Yes? Well, suppose those cylinders of mine scattered over the Earth have some connection with it. They take in solid matter and it vanishes completely. It's a fantastic process and it, it must have a purpose. Is it possible that, that they absorb substances in order to transmit them elsewhere? To send them perhaps back to where the cylinders themselves came from? Back across space? Back to the tenth planet itself? If so, oh, we're up against something so big we don't realize it's staring us in the face. Martians are on the way. They surely have a Lulu of a technique. Nerve warfare. And we're the first victims. Any time now, we'll be at one another's throats. Oh, Cliff, don't. Don't say things like that, even in fun. Yeah, I'm sorry. Should we talk about the weather? I'm tired. I think I'll go and... Oh, I left my file of notes in the lab. And I want to write them up at home. I'd better slip back and get them. Not alone, you don't. Peter, he won't be there. I'll walk up to the college with you. No. I'd rather be on my own. I'll ring her tomorrow. Okay. I'll stay here a bit. Sorry, Chuck. No, forget it. Good night. Good night. Elizabeth left the coffee bar at exactly 11.35. She walked into Cromwell Road entered the deserted college and took the lift up to the third floor. Reaching the laboratory and switching on the lights, the first thing she did was look quickly at the rod standing in the denser light cubicle. It was dull and silent. Elizabeth could see her own pale face reflected, distorted in its polished green surface. Automatically, she ran her eye over the recording instruments. The meter needles were all quite still. Near the cubicle lay the cylinder, a huge empty shell. She smiled. Already dust was gathering on it. She collected her folder of papers from the bench and walked back towards the door. And then she stopped. Even before she looked round, she knew. By the air becoming colder each second, chilling, biting, and by the slow flood of unearthly green light which bathed the wall, confronting her with her own black rearing shadow. And as she spun round, her breath made a white cloud and something crackled under her feet, frost, forming rapidly, white and glinting. The green glare from the rod growing fiercer hurt her eyes. 
Then the vibration rattling the benches and apparatus, dinning in her ears and dulling her mind. She found herself walking against her will towards the cubicle, her aching eyes fixed on the glowing core of the rod. Something seemed to be drawing her towards it. She bumped something. It clicked as she put out a hand, but she went on. She cried out, but her voice seemed not to belong to her, to come from a vast distance. Seconds passed. There was no thought in her mind. And then, something seemed to to burn her fingers. Forcing her eyes down, she saw it was the lock bar of the cabinet, white with ice. She had lifted it, and the door was swinging open. Now she was very close to the blazing rod, and softly, silently, a grey vapour was beginning to seep from its surface. With a frantic effort, she forced herself to think, to move, to step back. But the noise wouldn't let her think. Something somewhere was calling, demanding, willing her to obey. Her eyes fell on the laboratory telephone. One clear thought, one hope came, and she clung to it. Telephone. Cliff. Got it, Bar. Phone number. Seen it so often. Phone number on the menus. Think. Sloan. Oh, one. Number on the menus. Sloan. Yes. The frozen steel of the telephone dial bit at her fingers. It seemed to take all her strength to turn it, release it, if word back. Her mind was blurring, slipping away again. Another one. And another. And another. Hello? Oh, yes, he is here. I tell him. Hey, Mr. Clifford, your young lady is on the phone for you. Okay. Hello? Cliff here. Is that you, Liz? Hello? Cliff, I tried. I I didn't know if... Hey, Liz, what's wrong? Cliff, please come. Please. I can't fight it much longer. Oh, Liz, what is it? Are you in the lab? Yes. Cliff, help me. I mustn't go back. Liz. Liz. Honey, hang on. Whatever it is, hang on. I'll be right with you. Liz. Liz, are you in there? Liz, for heaven's sake, can you hear me? Clifford had reached the college, the doors of the laboratory. They wouldn't open. Something had fallen across them, jamming them on the inside. Peering helplessly through the glass panels, he saw grey, swirling vapour. The room was choked with it, and everywhere a wintry whiteness of frost and ice. He saw dimly the open cubicle and the rod glowing a dull green. The telephone and its receiver just cleared of the floor, swinging slowly on its cord. But there was no sign of Elizabeth. The laboratory seemed quite empty. That was Orbit One Zero. A play in six episodes, written by Peter Elliot Hayes, and produced for the BBC by David Davis. From London, we present Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode 5, The Frozen World. Tom Lambert here again. A strange cylinder buried beneath a northern... ...causing solid matter to vanish from the face of the earth. Possibly even transmitting it across the vastnesses of space. 
In the fourth recording, you heard how Elizabeth returned alone to the laboratory. How the cylinder began to operate with a new intensity. Now, we were very near to understanding the whole unbelievable truth. Here is the fifth recording. If I had known that night the terrible risk Elizabeth had taken, that I was a mile away, sitting by my study fire with McLaren. Clifford knew, though. He could see the writhing mist, the white fur of frost smothering everything, the telephone swinging mutely on its cord, but not Elizabeth Ryder. Liz! Liz, are you in there? Liz, for heaven's sake, can you hear me? Got to get these doors open. Clifford moved across the passage and hurled himself bodily at the doors. They burst in, sending something rasping across the floor, a filing cabinet that had toppled across them on the inside. Dreadful, paralyzing cold closed about him. This was nothing we had seen before. The whole laboratory was an arctic landscape. The apparatus, the benches, no more than humped shapes beneath the coating of ice. Grotesque, glittering icebergs. The Densolite cubicle had become a nightmare refrigerator, a hollow case of ice containing the only thing unchanged, the rod, its green flickering growing duller each second. Clifford tottered and fell heavily. The floor itself was a gleaming sheet of ice. He dragged himself up, and then he gasped with relief. Liz! Oh, heaven, I thought maybe you... Oh, no. Hidden from the doors, Elizabeth was lying between the benches, and she was very still. Her clothing, her hair were white with frost. Her face was white and pinched, and her eyes were closed. Clifford crawled to her side, tried to lift her, but her coat, stiff as a board, was frozen fast to the floor. Oh, no good. I have to get some help. He tried the telephone, but the dial wouldn't turn. The instrument was frozen solid. He staggered from the laboratory, raced down the passage into my study, and dialed 999. Some hours later, in the quiet of a hospital ward, Clifford McLaren and myself stood at the bedside of a white-faced, shaken, but still living Elizabeth, waiting till she could tell us her story. Hi, Liz. Hello, Chris. You should have stayed for that other coffee. How are you feeling? Cold. Still very cold. Sorry to be such a nuisance, Doctor. Oh, my dear child. I shouldn't have gone back. Well, you weren't to know. Now, don't talk if you don't want to, my dear. I do want to, but... Well, can you tell us what happened? It was so cold. Ice was just growing on everything. I knew I had to telephone... I tried to remember the coffee bar number. Did I? Sure you did. You got through. When I arrived out there, the whole darn place was turning into a glacier. But before that, Miss Ryder, how did it begin? Why did you want to telephone? Why did you not just come out? I don't know. I was leaving when it started. I remember seeing my own shadow on the wall. Then the noise. That awful noise. I couldn't think. Because of the other sounds. What other sounds? Strange sounds. I couldn't understand them. Elizabeth, try to remember. I can't. My mind wouldn't work. Elizabeth, what other sounds did you hear? You must tell me. Like, oh, like voices. Quiet, gentle voices. Whispering. I tried to understand them. They wanted to be understood. And I knew I could if only. But it was so cold. Go on, go on. I wanted to go nearer, to hear them better. Uh, nearer? Uh, to the cubicle? Yes. They wanted me to. And I was talking. I remember now I kept on talking. Yes. I don't know what I said. I couldn't take my eyes off the rod. That green light. I wanted to be close to it. To be warm. And then? Oh, Elizabeth, stay awake. Sorry. Then... I suddenly felt frightened. Yes? I knew I mustn't. I had to keep the voices out of my head. 
I just kept on thinking of the telephone. I thought, if I can just get to the telephone, it should have been black, but it had turned white. It hurt my hands. Yes. And then, oh, why can't they make this room warm? He would leave her alone. Yes, I can now. Thank you, my dear. Have a good rest. You've more than earned it. I think we should go now. So long, Liz. The doctor says you should be fit enough to come out tomorrow. Thanks, Kev. I keep on getting rescued by you. I mustn't let it become a habit. <laughs> She's almost asleep. Come along. We went back to the college, to the laboratory. The ice had all disappeared, but the place looked as if a flood had swept through it. It was late. We were all exhausted. There seemed nothing more we could do. We stood there aimlessly, helplessly, while the water dripped dismally around us. Well, I don't know. Voices whispering, wanting to be understood. Doctor, was she just a bit lightheaded, or did she really hear something? Yes, Clifford, I believe she did. That was why she stayed. She had to. He would. Are you telling us that that object spoke... That a voice came from it? Not a voice, but something that was able to reach her mind, that wanted to communicate with it. Aye, and the signals reaching the telescope. Again, an attempt at communication. Exactly. It must fit together two forms, perhaps, of the same thing. Hey, Doctor, look at this. What is it? The tape recorder. It's running. <gasps> And the tape half used. It switched to record. It wasn't operating when I bust in here, but it is now. And the microphone is still connected. Clifford, you said Elizabeth fell about here. Yeah, that's right. Well, suppose she stumbled against it, pressed her hand down on it. And switched it on. It would have started recording. Yes. And gone on until the cold froze the motor to a standstill. And it's only just thawed and started up again. Clifford, take the tape off. I have a recorder at home. We can try it there. This place is still uncomfortably chilly. And before we go, make quite certain the cubicle is properly secured. After this, no one is to be alone in here, not for one minute. I've got the tape laced up, sir. Let's hear it, then. Though well, I doubt if it picked up much under those conditions. Here she goes, then. Nothing. Oh, it has to warm up. Ah, listen. Hey, that's it. The rod going flat out. She did start it going. Shh. Seen it so often. Phone number on the menus. Think. She was trying to get me at the coffee bar. And I was sitting down there feeling so sorry for myself if I'd have known what she was doing. Cliff, please come. Please. I can't fight it much longer. Yes. Cliff, help me. I mustn't go back. She dropped the receiver. Yes. Now, those vital four minutes before you got to the laboratory. If we can hear what happened in that time, though we must. Hey, listen to that. It never made that noise before. Now she's walking towards it, getting near the cubicle. Are you? Yes, I can hear, but you are so far away. I will try to understand. The cylinders come from your world. Many were lost on the journey, but many have landed safely. Yes, we are in no danger. No danger. You intend us no harm... Yes. The cylinders are your way of exploring our planet, which you believe may be inhabited. Yes. They collect samples, solids and gases. Transmit them back for analysis. Yes. In this way, you are surveying our world without leaving your own. To you, space and time are not impassable barriers. Hey, what? Do you hear? This is wait. Now you are trying to communicate with us directly. Yes. If we are intelligent beings, 
we are to answer. Yes. Yes, we do understand. But how are we to answer? It is so cold. Yes, I am trying. Yes? There may be another way. We are not to be afraid if you take the next step. If you use the rods to... What? Oh. And that's all we shall hear, I suppose. That was when the recorder finally froze up and stopped. It's a wonder it kept going as long as it did. Well, Hayward, you were right. Voices from the tenth planet. Yes. An inhabited planet, Campbell. Though by what inconceivable form of life. I what? So that is the purpose of the cylinders. What incredible technology. No clumsy rockets, no feeble attempts to land on a planet where conditions might be dangerous to them. No. First, a systematic remote control survey. Fifty years... By now, they must have built up a complete knowledge of the Earth's composition. Its geology, its atmosphere, its lands, its oceans. And we fondly imagine that we are far advanced in science. Well, at least one weights off our minds. They're not hostile. No. They're still only seeking knowledge. Thank heaven there's no danger after all. No, no danger. They seem anxious to reassure us on that. Obviously, they have no way of coming here, even if they wanted to. That distance, it, it's out of the question. Oh, that may be just as well. What manner of creatures can exist there? A frozen planet, a hundred times the size of Earth, 5,000 million miles away. It could be no biochemical life as we understand it. Yeah, but what's that they said? Time and space are not impassable barriers. They said that. Quite so. Well, you must act on this as you think best. I must get back. I've been too long away from the telescope already. When I left, young Garrick was working like a maniac. On the signals, you mean? Yes. He's pretty sure the breakthrough isn't far off now. Well, we must know if they are part of the same project. We can suppose now that they are. But it's strange that they were not mentioned in the message that Elizabeth understood. Aye, that's odd. But once we can find the basic key to those transmissions... We'll know. And I must see Lord Heatherton again tomorrow. He must hear this recording. Perhaps there is no real urgency now if one keeps a safe distance from the cylinders, but all the same... Well, just one thing on my mind, sir. What's that? We didn't get the end of that message. The tape stopped too soon. It did. Liz did, but she can't remember. No. We were not to be afraid if they used the rods to take the next step. Now, that's what gets me. What else could they be used for? What next step? The next day was sunny, and I felt easier in my mind than I had for a long while. But a shadowy doubt still lurked. We had made a momentous discovery. We seemed at last to have reached the truth. Then, why did I feel that the pieces had dropped into place too conveniently. Was there still something we had overlooked? I was just leaving for Whitehall when Tom Lambert arrived. He had been busy since I last saw him, and he wasted no time. He slapped a thick sheaf of papers on my desk. The neat teleprinter type, page after page of it, told a disturbing story. Here's the first installment, Doctor, straight off the wires. They're coming in thick and fast. The Ministry teamed up with the Foreign Office. They've got every foreign news service working overtime. And these are all accounts of the same kind of phenomena? Yeah, dug out of newspaper files all over the known world. And like ours, they go back for 50 years and more. Well, let's have a look. Yes, everywhere. Australia, Alaska, Norway, South America. Yeah. Even one from the Philippines. And in every case, the same symptoms. Earth tremors, vibration, violent drops in temperature. In a few places, the things were seen to land. Were there? A streak of blue-white light. A quick concussion and, and then just a small hole in the ground. Well, they would arrive white hot after passing through the atmosphere. In many cases, they were assumed to be meteorites. But they go down so deep, they're impossible to dig out. Well, they must strike the earth at tremendous speed. Oh, say. The one we found under that beach must somehow have been slowed down, perhaps through colliding with a real meteor shower. Hmm. And uh, how many of these are there? Well, so far, 208. 208? 
208. And the reports are still coming in? Oh, the minister must see these too. Distributed over the entire surface of the globe. So many. Just for a survey. What was that, Doctor? Oh, I was... Uh, I was just thinking aloud. Oh. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Lambert. Uh, by the way, we've, um... We've uh, come to the conclusion that there's no serious danger from these things. Oh? Provided they're kept at a respectful distance. Well, let's hope you're right, Doctor, because I've got a news flash too. Our South Wales correspondent tells me that troops have moved in. Moved in where? Lanweplin. Good heavens. Yeah, they're mounting a guard on the old pit. Seems the official view is a little less confident than yours. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I must be going. I'll pass on anything I can. Well, thanks, Doctor. I'll be around. I have a small theory of my own. I think we may be comparing notes again before long. Half an hour later, I was again in that quiet high room behind Whitehall. Lord Heatherton's face was more serious than it had been before. He listened to the tape recording and examined the bundle of reports. Well, this is really only what we expected, isn't it, Doctor? Except bigger, over 200 cylinders. So many and so evenly distributed. No country, no corner of the world overlooked. Rather like some enormous spy system. As you say, why should they need so many? And that recording, we are dealing with something quite outside our knowledge. But if their intentions really are peaceful, is there any way we can reply? Well, uh, according to Professor McCallum, none at present. Uh, in time, a signaling apparatus might be built, and it might be powerful enough to send short waves to the Tenth Planet. A lot of mites, Doctor. Oh, yes, indeed. Anyway, I'll tell you what we are doing about this. Plotting every suspected site in this country, guarding each one we confirm with an army unit. Yes, I heard. The public must be protected. Our delegate is addressing the United Nations Scientific Commission today. Then I hope the same will happen abroad. Detecting, plotting, and observation of sites. And here in this red folder is another scheme I've drawn up. Oh. I, I can't tell you the details yet, but they are also being put before the commission. What sort of scheme? Just certain emergency measures, should they for any reason become necessary. Yes, but, but I, I, do. I know what you're going to say. This is knowledge, vital knowledge. We must be on our guard against any instinctive hostility. I agree. But better safe than sorry, Doctor. I see. But what do we do immediately? A famous politician once said a famous saying. Wait and see. Carry on with your work for another week. If no new developments occur, then I shall arrange for several other cylinders to be excavated. And then? Already there are some high-level proposals. An international authority to decide how best to develop this interplanetary contact. And research centers will be needed, an international fund coordination. Yes, of course. Another week. And then it'll be out of my hands. Not entirely. There will be work as part of a team for all the specialists we have. Your lecturing on cosmic science will be valuable. My lecturing? This is a big event in the history of our small world, Doctor. We must be big enough each in our own way to meet it. Yes, I understand. Uh, now, perhaps you would excuse me. I have rather a lot to do. I have to report to Parliament this afternoon. But I rather think all the honourable members will stay awake to listen to me today. Outside, Whitehall was grey and cold. The sun had gone. A steady drizzle was falling. The cars and buses elbowed each other. The passers-by huddled into their coats and went on their million and one different errands. Everything was as it should be on a dismal November London afternoon. So solid, so normal. What, I found myself saying, can possibly change any of this? The few slabs of coloured plastic we were making such a to-do about? It suddenly seemed absurd. Oh, how little we knew then. I drove back to the college. I went up to the laboratory and stood looking at the rod dark and silent in the cubicle. Would we ever know? And anyway, in a few days, it would be taken away. I hardly heard the doors open behind me. We thought you might see help. Hello, Doctor. Hello, Doctor. Elizabeth, Clifford. Oh, I was daydreaming. Uh, how are you, my dear? Quite all right, Mama. Good. They let me out this morning. Cliff told me about the recording I seem to have made. I still don't remember. He didn't want me to come here again, but I wanted to see that. 
It told me something. More than was on the tape. And I repeated it. But it's gone. Well, it may come back to you. In any case, our work's nearly over. Special authorities, international funds. There'll be no place for us. Oh, well, it had to happen. What I can possibly do in one week. I could try again. I think I can send it. No, I won't hear of it. You've done your share, Elizabeth. Another time, that terrible freezing, you... You might not be so lucky. Now we can only... Wait. The next morning, Saturday, the newspapers exploded. Theories, speculations, accusations, advice. Plenty of advice. The story had broken at last. By 11, my house was besieged by reporters. Every reporter in London, it seemed, except Tom Lambert. My front doorbell and telephone rang furiously until I disconnected them both. I saw no one all day and I spoke to no one. I slept badly that night. I kept hearing the sound of the cylinder. And once, I think it was three in the morning, I got up and rang the college. But the disgruntled voice of Simmons assured me that all was quiet in the laboratory. The next day was the same. Now, the tireless gentleman of the press resorted to the door knocker. I couldn't do much about that. Then three solid policemen appeared outside and peace returned. Late in the afternoon, Clifford and Elizabeth called. I was glad to see them and asked them to stay for dinner. It was a silent meal. The wind seemed very strong outside, rattling the windows behind the curtains and scurrying round the deserted square. We were not to know it then, but elsewhere the night was even wilder. Far away, a bitter gale was lashing the Isle of Skara and howling through the girders of the radio telescope high above Kirkuit. You're sure about this? You can't have made a mistake. I broke the code this afternoon. Stumbled on it almost by accident. Once I confirmed the ten basic groups, the rest just fell into place. I got this clear transcription from the first long sequence I tried. But it's English. Oh, it is now. But it could be any language. The signals don't convey a letter alphabet. They're a series of numerical progressions representing shades of meaning. A sort of mathematical grammar. And this is what you've translated so far? I'll work through the rest as fast as I can. This is enough. Goodness gracious, Peter. If this is true, I must talk to Petri. He must know about this at once. We were sitting round the fire when the telephone rang. At first we ignored it. But it wouldn't stop. At last I asked Clifford to answer it. Yes, he's here. Hold on, will you? Doctor, it's Professor McLaren calling from Scarra. Oh, I wouldn't like his phone bill. Hello, Campbell. He what? Yes. He what? Garrick has broken the signal code. What? When? A few hours ago. He's translated a passage. I've got the paper here. What? What does it say? I'd better read it. It's short enough. Are you listening? Yes, yes. If the cylinders speak... Do not believe what they say. Your planet is in great danger. Destroy them. Good heavens. That's repeated three times. Then, when the great cold comes, it will be too late. The great cold? Is that all? Aye. Garrick's at work on the rest. I'll be down tomorrow, Haywood. I'll get a plane. Good. Let's hope it... It isn't as bad as I think it is. Yes. Well, thank you, Campbell. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, did you hear that, Clifford? If the cylinders speak, do not believe them. Then all that about peaceful intentions and seeking knowledge. Well, it's to throw us off our guard, to save the cylinders. Perhaps so that... Oh, what a monumental idiot I've been. The tenth planet, in some way, it must be divided. That's why signals have been coming from two directions. And if the cylinders transmit matter... Well, of course. We must go to the laboratory. There's no knowing how much time we have. Nothing. The rod is still up. I was half expecting. 
expecting. Quiet now. It's only waiting. Don't you see, either of you? This marvel of creation we've come close to worshipping, it can beam matter across space. We've known that for weeks. But we've been blind. If it can transmit in one direction, it can do it in the other. From Earth to the tenth orbit. Oh. From there to here. Precisely. But but what would they need to send through? Oh. Themselves. Whatever they are, themselves. We've heard their voices. Next time, we shall see them. But the next step, we were not to be afraid. We were to wait to help them. Doctor, look. The rod. It's starting to flicker. Oh. The green light. It's beginning. It must be. And the cold. Can you feel it? Oh, well, we must choose now. Knowledge or survival. Clifford, yeah? the builders left the sledgehammer uh -huh. in the passage. Get it. Get it, I say. Okay. What are you going to do? Do what primitive man did when he saw danger. Fight. Here it is. Some hammer. Must weigh 30 pounds. Elizabeth, open the cabinet. Open. Do as I say quickly. All right. Now, tip the rod over. Pull it. It won't hurt you yet. I'll help you. All right. Right. There it is, Clifford. Now, use those Canadian muscles of yours. Smash it. Yeah, but we can't just... Smash it, I tell you. If you won't, I shall have to. Okay. Stand back. Here it goes, then. It won't break. Harder. Harder. All your strength, Clifford. It must break. It must. Oh, it's hopeless. It won't... It won't even... Here. The ice! It's no good. They knew it would come to this. They planned. They made sure. Nothing can destroy this thing. Nothing. That was Orbit One Zero. A play in six episodes, written by Peter Elliot Hayes, and produced for the BBC by David Davis. From London, we present Orbit One Zero, a play in six episodes by Peter Elliot Hayes. Episode 6, The Unseen. Lambert here. This is the last time I shall be speaking to you. I've done what I intended. And now only those last unforgettable days remain to be told. A tenth planet. Five thousand million miles distant. And yet on that windy November night, no farther than the flickering green rod in a Kensington building. This was the link. A frail door separating our world from a frozen giant on the rim of space. Now it was opening. And what would cross the threshold? Here is Dr. Petrie's sixth and last recording. Final notes on 10th Planet. We had had our warning. The signals had told us the true purpose of this scattered network of cylinders. And now the hour of the rods had come. Not now to absorb another telltale specimen of our Earth, but to send something through. But our understanding had come too slowly. Even as Clifford's hammer rang on the unbreakable green surface, I knew we were too late. I felt as he did. Nothing could destroy this thing. Nothing. We hurried to my study. Then telephone calls to Bancroft, head of the college, to the Ministry of Science, to the police. I felt we were going to need their help. Meanwhile, the terrible freezing went on. Some hours later, the whole corridor passing the laboratory for full 30 yards each way had become one shining low-roof tunnel of solid ice. 
Out of it swept gusts of bitterly cold air. It was like looking into the dead, green-lit heart of an iceberg. And somewhere in the dim, frozen cavern that had been the laboratory, the rod still throbbed angrily. The night passed. The freezing continued, but nothing more. With the dawn of Sunday morning came fog. A blanket of good, honest fog beneath which all London peered and coughed and which shrouded the Victorian spires and turrets of the college. Ten o'clock, we were back at my house for welcome coffee and buttered toast and a telephone bell I was beginning to dread. It was Elizabeth who saw the black and silver limousine stop outside and the short, overcoated figure who hurried up the steps. It was Lord Heatherton, and the minister, it appeared, had set many wheels in motion. The college told me I'd find you here. Well, Doctor, I had my own forebodings, but nothing as alarming as this. Perhaps we shall get a clearer picture when McLaren deciphers the rest of those signals. He's on his way here now. He's flying down from Scotland. We should know something soon. I hope so. Meantime, that rod is turning your college into one huge refrigerator. It certainly is. Creating the conditions they are used to. Undoubtedly. Well, the police are watching from every possible vantage point. Yes. If any other phenomena develop, we shall hear. Good. And uh, the other cylinders, this may be the, the first of many. You recall that red file? Yeah, I do. We're putting the emergency measures into effect at once. Oh. So long as the plotted cylinders are passive, they will be left for the time being. But wherever activity is seen, I'm afraid it is going to be dealt with. After that warning, we can take no chances. Mm. How dealt with, sir? The army. Bulldozers and excavating parties first. Then troops with mortars and demolition charges. If that is not enough, there are tanks and heavy artillery standing by. Oh, my word. And if necessary, there is bomber command. Explosives? I wonder. I think we can cope. That specimen in the college is the one we must watch. I quite agree, then. That is our guide to what to expect later from all the rest. If that turns out to be a damp squib, there may be nothing to worry about. Well, let's true. hope so. Now I must get back to Whitehall. Reports from the war office should be coming in any time now. If there is any news, let me know at once. Certainly. Yes, of course. Lord Heatherton's car slid away into the fog. A few minutes later, a taxi chugged out of it and deposited McLaren and Peter Garrick on the pavement. With the future of the world in the balance, I observed Campbell still found three minutes to wrangle with the driver over the fare. But when he was pacing my study, gripping a bundle of papers, there were grim lines around his mouth, and his eyes were without hope. I have decoded the rest. The last section on the plane coming down. We chartered a private one at Renfrew. It's all here, Hayward. Yes, an intelligent, lucid history. Successes and setbacks on a world we can't even begin to imagine. And a disaster. Disaster? Look, uh, it'll save time if Garrick just gives you the gist of it. Tell them, Peter. Well, the tenth planet is inhabited. Not by one dominant species as here, but by two. By two? Yes, two races. who have always kept to their respective sides of the planet. Alien, hostile, endlessly at what we would call a cold war. No truer world than those temperatures. No, sure. quite so. The inhabitants of the site receiving what little light and heat there is are highly advanced technologically. Fifty years ago, in our time, they perfected the system of sending the surveying cylinders across space to Earth which they considered the planet most likely to support organic life. I see. The method we know now, how the cylinders are simulated samples, dismantled them into individual molecules and beamed them back. At the other end, there are special receivers, and they're reintegrated for examination. Well, so far, so good. And this, originally, was the only purpose of the cylinders. Mm. Then the blow fell. What blow? Well, they were suddenly and ruthlessly overrun by the inferior beings from the other face of the planet. The signals refer to them as the Dark Ones. The dark, dark, ones. dark Ones. The Dark Ones. And they took control of the system and soon discovered that the samples coming back were rich in chemicals and minerals. Substances rare to them. Yes, we became a desirable base. An ideal potential mining colony. Of course. Gravity, free water and plenty of solar heat. Yes, I see. And the means were already here. 
planted in a thousand different spots. So the plan took shape. First, communication. To assure us of the harmlessness of the rod. Yes. And then, themselves. To explore Earth at first hand. The Dark Ones. They're very confident in themselves, Haywood, because they've done it once already. What? Our moon. The moon? Chosen for a pirate experiment. No. They landed cylinders and sent a number of their creatures through. It worked, and they got back. Now they're ready for the full-scale operation. Us. The next step. Yes, the next step. What the Dark Ones did not discover was a high-frequency radio transmitter, another part of the original survey. It had been beaming signals for a long time, in the hope of making semantic contact with us. And it was continuing to operate in secret. But now, it sent out warnings. Endless, repeated warnings. There was just a chance we might understand and be ready. And, uh, that's all? No, not quite. There's another short sequence, uh, but it's very distorted. I'm still working on it. I think the Dark Ones have detected the signals, and I think they're jamming them. And nothing to tell us what these beings, these Dark Ones, are like. No, nothing at all. What could evolve out there? Gravity to make a human weigh 500 tons. Perpetual near darkness with temperatures close to absolute zero. Incredible. In those cells, a, a human would be three miles high. We can't begin to imagine, Campbell. No, indeed. And we can't wait and wait until that ghastly thing up there... Maybe the waiting's over. Yes. Yes, speaking. Huh? I see. When was this? Yes, I'll come at once. The college. Something's happened. The rod has stopped. Stopped? Yes. But there are still noises. New noises. We'd better go. over the freezing, the vibration, but now there's something else. It comes and goes. Listen. You hear? Not in the laboratory, though it's on that side of the building. Lower down. And it seems to be moving about. We must go up. If we can get close enough to see. So wrap yourselves up. No one take their gloves off. The cold up there is terrible. We climbed the six flights again. Frost on the stairs. Our feet left prints in it. Now almost the entire third floor was a nightmare arctic landscape of ice. But it was dripping, thawing. We picked our way along white tunnels that had been corridors and reached the laboratory. There was a mound of solid ice. The denser light cubicle entombed. It was silent. And then... We followed the sound, stumbling and slithering along the ice-encrusted passages. It was a strange, unreal hunt, our breath making white clouds in the freezing air. We reached the landing with the lift and stopped. Hey, well, look. Those lift gates, the steel trellis, ripped to pieces and the sliding doors like a car has been driven through this lift stuck on the floor above don't go too near the edge it's a long drop do you hear it? it's coming from the, the shaft I must don't lean out there sir one slip and you've had it just kneel down I'll hold on to your coat can you see anything? yes yes I can there's there's something down there it, it fills the bottom of the shaft Gray, moving, pulsing, but not solid. It's more like a, it's more like a crowd, but it, it has a, a kind of outline, a, a shape. 
It has happened. One of them has come through. Now the police took matters into their own hands. In ten minutes, Cromwell Road was empty and closed to traffic. Surrounding buildings were emptied, and their bewildered occupants escorted out of the area. Still the fog pressed down. It was soon clear that the grey vapour was seeping out of the lift shaft into the basement. The rumbling grew more frequent and more violent. Now things were happening in Simmons' domain, and he led us down to a storeroom where there was a ventilating grill through which the basement could be seen. We peered through, and there it was. Vapour. A grey, shifting pool. Shapeless, yet keeping a compact mass with a dull, billowing surface. Still for long minutes, then flattening and rolling silently as if seeking a way out. Incredible. And that's it. A living, solid thing. Living, but not solid. Well, it's logical, of course. A planet as massive, as cold as that. Beings with very loose molecular structure... Not affected by the tremendous gravity. Little more to our eyes than a gas. Able to expand or contract themselves at will. And cold. Cold as the place they came from. We went up again to meet Tom Lambert hurrying across the hall. Well, Mr. Lambert... Come to say I told you so. I think this is no surprise to you. Well, cylinders operating in reverse, you mean? It struck me as a possibility. Oh, it struck you as a possibility. Not worth mentioning, of course. Sorry, Doctor, but it was only a guess. When I assumed they could be knocked out if they got troublesome. Seems I was wrong. Mr. Lambert, we are not your admiring readers. You needn't dramatize it. Sorry. But listen, the reports coming into the war office, they're not good. Several of the cylinders have had the full treatment shot at and blown up. The casings have split, but the rods haven't even cracked. Oh, great heavens. They tried tanks on Exmoor, but the engines froze before they could get near. Well... The Air Ministry are ready to try pinpoint bombing where they can, but if armor-piercing shells won't even scratch... No, I was afraid of this. Has, uh, Has anything else been reported? Yeah. Several of them are operating violently. You know, green light, intense cold. Aye, that's the pattern. Fourteen hours of freezing. The energy build-up. And then the breakthrough. This one is ahead of the others. Excuse me, Dr. Police here. Uh, yes, Superintendent... Oh, Doctor, um, we've got some asbestos suits from the fire service. Two of my men have got into the basement. What? Oh, for heaven's sake, they... Oh, they needn't have worried. Apart from about ten tons of ice, it's empty. What? The doors out of the car park have been torn off their hinges. Whatever it is that was in there, it's gone. Hmm. And then, in the fog... The real hunt began. By now, visibility was down to a few yards. One heard things. Footsteps, a car engine starting, a voice calling. But they seemed on the other side of a soft white wall. Constables groped about with flashlights, keeping in touch by blowing their whistles. The police cars crawling cautiously, their headlights glowing like pairs of yellow eyes, fanned out and others converged to join them from all over London. We stationed ourselves on the pavement outside the college by the superintendent's car. Its radio, in constant touch with the Scotland Yard control room, chattered continually, and its operators scribbled on their pads and handed the messages out to us. But we knew we were helpless. Yes, fog. The thing couldn't have a better camouflage. The black cat in the coal cellar had nothing on this. And the thing is... What will it do? Well, everything here is strange to it, Superintendent. It must explore. I think it will be cautious at first. And anyone meeting it? Oh, the only warning may be the cold. After that... Uh, by the way, where is Peter Garrick? Well, he stayed behind at your house. Yeah, I guess he wanted to keep working on the last sequence of signals. Message from 727. Junction of Brompton Road and Beaufort Gardens. Right. Here's something. Ice in Brompton Road. Continuous trail, some shop windows broken. So it went that way, moving northeast. 
Something gray seen on the road, they tried to shadow it, then the car engine packed up. So it can absorb energy on its own. Thank goodness it's Sunday. That road any other day and the shop's all open. 723 again, sir. They've abandoned their car. Let me see. A bus coming down Knightsbridge, its engine stopped too. Ice began to form all over it. Only a few passengers, they got off all right. Wilkins, yes, sir? tell them I want cars patrolling square. Knightsbridge, Kensington Road, and Sloan Street. Right, sir. Report the moment they have engine trouble. Yes, sir. That seems the best indication. I think it is. If we could only confine it to one area. But how do you try to stop a drifting patch of vapor? It's hopeless, Hayward. It can go where it likes, do what it likes. There is no way of stopping it. Another nerve-wracking hour passed. Things were found. An abandoned frozen bus, a thawing trail of ice, 15 feet wide, ending abruptly. Then more scraps of information. A frozen tree in Montpelier Square. A bent lamppost in Rutland Gate. A greenhouse collapsing under a coating of ice in Ennismore Gardens. It seemed to be moving north now, through the squares and back streets south of Hyde Park. The strangest thing was that, although it was traversing a thickly populated area... Nothing had been seen. We were completely baffled until... Here's trouble. This message. Prince's Garden, the chimney stack collapsed when cleaned through the roof. Occupants of house away. That was lucky. Nothing seen except a thick layer of ice on the roof. Then that's the answer. Why nobody's seen it? It can move about, clear of the ground. Whenever it encounters an obstacle, it, it just goes over it. Encouraging having you around, Doctor. So it's moving west now. If only it would settle for a short while. Perhaps we could do something. For another anxious 40 minutes, nothing. The trail seemed completely lost. And then a voice suddenly crackled from the dashboard radio. A report short and urgent from a police car patrolling Kensington Gore on the south edge of Hyde Park. A report so strange and ominous that the superintendent could contain himself no longer. We bundled into his car and the one behind and swept away into the fog. Fifteen minutes later, we were standing on steps that were slippery with ice. Behind us reared the tall, ornamented spire of the Albert Memorial, and beyond the empty wastes of Hyde Park. Across the road loomed the immense domed roundness of the Albert Hall. We knew then where the trail had ended. Look at the place. Covered in frost from the steps to the roof. It's in there, in the Albert Hall. Some of the doors were found smashed in. One of the caretakers went to investigate. There was the grey stuff seeping everywhere, along the passages, pouring over the galleries into the arena. He nearly collapsed with cold. Then it's expanding, growing. I'm afraid it is, but at least we know where it is. Doctor, listen. If this goes on, it will shake the whole building down. It's getting out of control, Petrie. There's another car. It's Peter Garrick. Looking as if his life depended on that piece of paper. Peter, what is it? I couldn't find you. That last passage, I've got it. It may be some help. Good. It's in fragments, but... Oh, there are some figures or formula, I think. But the rest, this is the point. The rods require energy to function. Aye, we know that. But it must be in controlled amounts. Ah. They cannot tolerate too much at one time. It can damage them. They're one weakness. An excess of energy, of power... Oh, if we could only... Oh, if we... Bowers attacking that thing in the laboratory. It's not going to affect that. Not now. I'm not so sure. That information was not sent without reason. In some way, the organism may still depend on the rod. There might be a way. The cyclotron in the atomic energy department at the college. It gets tremendous voltages. Yeah, from the diesel electric generators. Yes. They can be started up in a few minutes. They're on the ground floor, though. I, I have an idea, but it'll mean hard work. And enough hands to do it. I guess we can raise those, sir. Then let's go back. Fog or no fog, Superintendent, your men have got to drive. There's just a small chance, but every second is going to count. It was a thin thread of hope, but we had to clutch at it. At the college, Clifford checked the fuel tanks. They were full. With six willing constables, we raided the electrical engineering floor for tools and a heavy drum of high-tension cable. The massive bank of generators was in a wing on the ground floor. The cable was run out. 
Clifford and McLaren were left to bear the end and connect up the steel and copper core. The rest of us set to work manhandling the cumbersome wooden drum up six flights of stairs, unreeling the tarred cable as we went. <coughs> it was easier to reach the laboratory now, though much ice still remained. With hammers and wrenches, we chipped and levered until we'd freed the rod and toppled it from the cubicle. With numb hands, we rolled in the cable drum and unwound some more turns. I wanted a contact as close as possible. Four slithering policemen, straining on an iron bar, raised one end of the silent rod, and the rest of us struggled with the leathery serpent until we'd passed three loops round it. The telephone, now working again, rang. It was quivered. The cable was connected up. We should soon know now. I made everyone stand back and gave the signal to run up the generators. It was Elizabeth who remembered that the Albert Hall could be seen from the college roof. Telling Clifford to increase the current steadily, we hurried to the iron staircase and were soon standing among the chimney stacks and skylights, peering across the jumbled Kensington rooftops. The fog seemed thinner up there. We could just make out the domed mass of the Albert Hall a quarter of a mile away. It had a strange, white, luminous appearance. Ice! The whole place is smothered in it. The power should be building up, I know. At full speed, those generators produce enough to supply all London twice over. And more than enough to burn out that cable. What are we doing, Edward? Fighting something we haven't a chance against. We're so small, so weak against that. Well, what I was thinking. Wait. Listen. Now, if we can hear it from here, it's growing stronger. The strength there, unimaginable strength. Doctor! The rod is flowing again, getting brighter as the current increases. Then it is absorbing the power. But, Hayward, don't you see? We're not attacking it, we're helping it. Feeding it with energy. This is just what it wants. I can't help it. Those signals can't be wrong. It's a chance we must take. It may be our only hope. If this goes on, that thing's growing. If it shatters the building and bursts out, Petrie, you must stop this. I can't, Edward. Those voices, I believe them. I believe they wanted to save us. What can we believe? There's no truth anymore. Do you want to unleash that? For pity's sake, tell Bowen to cut off the generator. No! If you don't, you may be responsible for... You hear that? The explosion? It shook the building. It must have been in the laboratory. Come on! The rod, when we all stood staring at it, had changed. It was dull and clouded. It had cracked in a thousand places. The tracery of silver wires was black and fused. It had seemed too much to hope, but it had happened. We clung to our hope as we raced to the Albert Hall. And when, fifteen minutes later, we were standing in the ice-cold amphitheater, we knew the threat had passed. Water dripped everywhere, but it was empty. Within minutes of the fusing of the rod, the vapor had become still, thin... Forgive me, Hayward. You were right. And you had the courage to believe in yourself. The power was too much for it. Burned it out. And this, this thing couldn't survive without it. Mm. And if that rod couldn't take it, nor can any of the others. They can all be treated in the same way. Yeah, any powerful electric circuit run near them. Well, I guess all over the world, a lot of electricians had better get busy. Yes, yes, it must be done as soon as possible. It came a long way, and this was the end of the journey. Did it hate us? Did it only want to conquer and destroy? Or, at the end, was it just trapped and alone? Could we have understood it? Oh, the tragedy is we shall never know. But there is a lesson, perhaps, for us. If we ever go out into space, as we shall, we must leave our differences, our quarrels behind. 
if we carry them with us to other worlds, as these did, we shall be condemned from the start, as they were. That, I suppose, ends my notes. The rest, that has become history. The burning out of the cylinders, wherever they were found. The fading away of the signals, which have never been detected since. Whether because they had served their purpose, or because the senders were themselves overrun, we can only guess. But the link with the tenth planet was broken. Perhaps for all time. That was all years ago. As I sit here and dusk falls over the green countryside, I wonder, is it a law of the universe that each race be bound to the surface of its own world, that we belong where we begin, a law that will eventually punish all who flout it? I do not know. But, as I say, I wonder... That was Felix Felton as Dr. Petrie in the final episode of Orbit One Zero, written by Peter Elliot Hayes. The music was taken from The Ritual Dances from a Midsummer Marriage by Michael Tippett, and the play was produced for the BBC by David Davis. Thanks for listening to this week's Retro Radio, Old Time Radio in the Dark. If you haven't done so yet, be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you like the show, please share it with someone you know who also loves old-time radio and pulp audio. If you want to hear even more, drop an email to weirddarkness at radioarchives.com and get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows absolutely free. That's weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. I'm Darren Marlar. I'll see you next time for Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. Retro Radio